Good morning. Good morning. I will start off slowly as we wait for our colleagues to trickle into the room. It is my greatest pleasure to be here in front of you today. My name is Nilafar Hedayat. My pronouns are she, her, and I will be the master of ceremonies over the next two days. Now, it is my privilege to be here today standing before you, but in my other life, I'm actually a journalist, a filmmaker, and a content creator, specifically focusing on the stories of women, children, and the environment. Now, welcome here today to the International Dialogue on Migration. This is our opportunity to get states, international organizations, civil society, local communities, and other key stakeholders involved uh, and discussing their experiences on migration, sharing ideas and stories about what's been going on in their worlds. Now, we aim to facilitate this dialogue by giving an opportunity for as many of you to speak as possible. That's my aim. That's what I'm going to try to do. We'll see how far we get. Now, ah, the doors have been shut. We are ready to begin. Before starting the meeting, I want to just draw your attention to some rules, some housekeeping rules for the conduct for this session. First and foremost, this session will be instantly translated and interpreted into six official UN languages, including Chinese, Arabic, French, English, Russian, and Spanish. That makes me sound very impressive because it sounds like I speak all these languages and I absolutely do not. But yes, thank you. Now, to allow for the interpretation uh, uh, to be done effectively, I will require my delegates, any interventions, and those speaking, to please do so in a measured way so that our interpreters have the time to be able to uh, interpret what you're saying. I have a very strict two minute intervention or speaking time allocated. Two minute, by the way, is the maximum, not the minimum. A reminder for everybody. Those of our colleagues that are joining us virtually, uh, there are cameras dotted around the room. Welcome, thank you so much for making the time to be here with us. May I ask you to please use either a USB connected speaker uh, or headphone device. Make sure that you're in a quiet place, that you have a stable internet connection so that we don't lose any meaning uh, or any of the thoughts that you so kindly want to share with us. So please try and do that if you can. Now, as MC, I will give the floor to participants in the room and online. So please be aware that for some of the panels, we will be opening the floor and having those interventions and contributions within the panel debate. And for some, it will be after. Leave it with me. I'll, I'll take care of that bit, just so you know. Okay, so with all of these housekeeping rules to one side, it is time for us to begin. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues and friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's IDM, focusing on the topic, think about tomorrow, act today, the future of human mobility and climate change. Now this IDM session will promote cross-theomatic and cross-regional connection, cross-regional connections, uh, highlighting challenges but also opportunities along with good practices to help place climate mobility very high on the agenda. Now our session here is going to have about 25 speakers and facilitators from all over the world, bringing diverse views and perspectives to this conversation, filling your brain with new and interesting ideas for you to take home. That will be our gift to you. We're also lucky enough to enjoy two multicultural musical performances by artists whose lives and careers have been shaped uh, by their migration story and their experiences of migration. If that's not enough for you, I've got more. There are going to be fantastic sensorial experiences that you can participate in outside of the hall in front of me. 
uh, to, to my side and you'll be able to go out there and participate. I'm not going to tell you anything about it because those of you watching online will be very jealous and we don't want that. But suffice it to say that there's going to be art exhibitions, virtual reality experiences on environment, migration and innovation. There's also a social media wall. So you could be famous and see yourself. It's brilliant. I, I love it. Uh, it will also share your tweets and a video series showcasing examples of solutions implemented by the IOM and partners to expand the range of options available to communities affected by climate change. Yes, I hope that the next two days are going to be an energizing and thought provoking IDM. I'm glad to be here and glad to get us started. Whew, it's a lot of talking on my part. Climate change and human mobility must be at the heart of discussions uh, in this and in other relevant forums and woven throughout what we do for a better future. Now is the time to act. And so let's start first with the, uh, a performance. Uh, we are very lucky to be graced with the talent of Julia Starr. Now, Julia is a mezzo-soprano born in Dakar, Senegal. As one of the most sought-after backing vocalists, she's worked with prominent musicians, I mean, from all over the world, for a very long time, including Miriam Makebe, Yusuf... N N Sorry, let me try that again. Yusu Ndur, Salif Keita, and Marcus Miller. She pursues a solo career now with songs rooted in her Wolof culture and the West African poly rhythm. Please clap and help me introduce Julia Starr. Yandu nafa Kampuma kurudofla Jinne jonghala Kendu korohan Yandu nafa Wetu geju musibala Waye joge fololo ladonya Yandu nafa Hindu na, Hindu na, you bu ma fa, fo fo adin na di dunda, na kuma saman lolo la yenenan, wan ma fun la iser, wan ma, wan ma, wan ma, niri daw lo genta. No huma saman, lolo la yeninan. When my fun lay said, when ma, ye did all log into. No huma saman, lolo la yeninan. Jinne jang khala, can do kodohan, can do kodohan. When my fun lay said, when ma, when ma, when ma. You did a log into Yanduna far. We took you, Musibada Jinne Jankala. Can look at the Han. One more fun lie said, One more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more. You put my fur. Fofu adina di dunda, no huma sama lolo la yenenan. One ma fun la isen, one ma, one ma, one ma, one ma. Jine yang kala, kendo kado kan, one ma. Yubu ma fa, fofu adina di dunda. One more fun I said, one more, one more, one more. Jinne jangkhala, kendu kodokhan, kendu kodokhan. Yobu mafa, fofu adina didunda. Jinne jangkhala, jangkhala, jangkhala. 
One more for I said one more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more. Jinne jang hala, jinne jang hala. Kendo kado kan, one more, for I said. Julia saw there with her absolutely captivating voice. I was mesmerized. Forgot to get up on stage. That's how mesmerized I was. Right. Time then for our keynote speeches for today. Um, I'd like to welcome on stage all the keynote speakers at once and then one in turn. I hope uh, that you can make your remarks. So please uh, welcome onto the stage DG Miss Amy Pope. Regional Director for Human Development, uh, Mikhail Redkowski. And also uh, we've got Khulud bin Mansour, who's the African Youth Ambassador for Peace. Welcome on stage, the three of you. Thank you, Mikhail. Good morning, Katie. Pleasure to meet you. I'm Mikhail Rutkowski. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, first, we will hear from Ms. Amy Pope of the United States of America, who begins her five-year term as the 11th Director General of the International Organization for Migration on like five days ago, six days ago. <laughs> Very new uh, to the job. Prior to her historic election, DG Pope was IOM's Deputy Director General for uh, Management and Reform. And uh, she is the first, this is really cool, sorry, choking up a bit. This is, she is the first woman uh, Director General of the IOM. She is one of the youngest uh, to ever hold a position like this at the United Nations agencies. DG Pope is a dynamic leader and demonstrates experiences in addressing very complex uh, migration issues and bringing transformative change across organizations. DG Amy Pope, please, could you take to the lectern and give us your keynote speech? Thank you very much. Welcome. So first of all, I, I have to correct something. It's not Amy Pope of the United States of America. It is Amy Pope of the International Organization for Migration. <laughs> It is so wonderful to have all of you here today, which I am telling everybody, and I want you to make it true, this is the hottest event in Geneva this week. I, I know some of you are thinking, well, the bar is kind of low. <laughs> but I know that with all of you here, with the voices, with your engagement, with the music, with the art, and with the extraordinarily thoughtful conversation, we can make this the hottest conversation in Geneva. So we're here today because we know the issue of climate is impacting human mobility in ways that we could not have predicted 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Just last year, over 60 million people, 60 million, were displaced because of disasters relating to climate. That is 60 million people, including across North America, people displaced by wildfires, Across Libya, people displaced by the storms, where thousands have died. Across the Pacific Islands, people who are displaced because of a range of storms, of sea level rise, and other disasters. And we're seeing this play out over and over and over again. And ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, it is time that we act. Because if we don't act, countless lives will be lost. Countless people will become homeless. Countless jobs and economic opportunities will be gone. Now, the purpose of having you all here today is to drive that conversation. 
and it's to do something a little bit different from the regular Geneva scene. It's to bring in the voices of people we don't always hear from, to bring in voices of young people, to bring in voices of the Pacific Islands, to bring in the voices of indigenous communities, to make sure that together we are hearing, we understand, we can empathize, and we will be called to action. Now, there are many ways that you can engage over the next two days. Number one, your presence here, your engagement, your thoughts, your feedback. This is a dialogue. This is not just meant to be listening to a bunch of people up here, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this is meant to spark, to provoke, and to push people into thinking about their role in responding to climate change. We're making it easy for you. We'll have music here. We'll have art exhibits so you can get a firsthand look at how people are experiencing climate around the world. We have virtual reality. Literally, you can put on the goggles and the earphones and have literally step into the shoes of someone who is experiencing the impacts of climate change. And at the end of this, we want you all to act. We want you all to be part of the solution. Now, there are exciting things happening, right? There is a growing awareness. I was at the Africa Climate Summit just a few weeks ago, where I was tremendously fortunate to work with many of our African member states who were expanding what's called the Kampala Declaration on Climate and Environment and Climate Change. And this, the Kampala Declaration, which is focused on the impact of climate on human mobility, was signed by over 30 of our African member states. That means that over 30 of our member states are recognizing the impact of climate change on their communities and calling people to act. I'm going out to the Pacific Island Forum in just about a month's time, where we expect leaders from across the Pacific to do the same thing. We know the conversations are happening in the Caribbean and in Latin America. It's time collectively that we all come together and we recognize the impact that climate is, happening, is having on real people every single day. But, and I know we all say, the first step is to admit you have a problem. So I'll take that, that's our first step. We're going to admit that we have a problem. We're going to admit that millions of people are living in climate vulnerable communities. The UNFCCC said over 300 million people are living in climate vulnerable communities. 300, people, 300 million people who do not have safety, security, or stability because of the possible impacts of climate change. But admitting you have a problem, that's just step one. If we really want to make a difference, we need, we need to get beyond admitting, and we get, need to get to acting. So that is why we are all here today. Wherever you are from in the world, whichever sector you represent in the world, whichever community you represent or identify with in the world, you are here today to act. So thank you for being part of this conversation. Thank you for being partners with the International Organization for Migration. And I have every confidence that working together, we will make a difference. Thanks very much. DG Amy Pope there, not of the USA, but the IOM. We move forward uh, now to our next keynote speaker. Michael Rutkowski is the Regional Director for Human Development for Europe, Central Asia, uh, for the World Bank. Now, previously, he was the Global Director for Social Protection and Jobs from 2016 to 2023. He oversaw the World Bank's work to protect the poorest and the most vulnerable and uh, from crises and shocks while supporting private sector-led growth. Please help me in welcoming Mikhail Lukowski. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. It's a big honor to take the stage after 
uh, after Madame Amy Hope of the IOM, uh, and I feel inspired by what you said, Amy, about uh, how we need to, in the form of a dialogue, proceed further with the migration uh, agenda and with what migration uh, uh, brings to our development challenges and opportunities. Uh, I actually arrived yesterday night from Turkey, of all the places, I see the Turkey delegation there, and so much what we do in Turkey is related to accommodating forcefully displaced people and migrants from other countries, especially in Syria, but doing it in a way in which the home population is treated at the same level and is not discriminated against. Otherwise, local population would not be as welcoming as they are to refugees and migrants from other countries, and I think Turkey gives us a very good example of, of that. Uh, this event is very much cast in the form of thinking about the links between climate change and migration. I very much appreciate that and I think it's very timely, especially in the context of the COP coming in December. So it's a good strategic leadership on the part of IOM to link those things very closely with each other because they, they are linked very closely. However, even in the absence of climate change, and I will come back to climate change in a moment, migration would be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, challenges and opportunities of development. The income differentials that, have, that persist across countries and continents, and the demographic transition that creates youth bulges in many countries in the global south, and that creates labor shortages in many countries of the global north, in themselves would already suggest that migration and remittances, which is a function of migration, should be elevated to a completely new level when we think about development. I actually do hold a very strong personal view that we should elevate migration to a much higher level uh, in thinking about development than it is present so, so far. For instance, by the way, if you look at European countries and think how they are going to solve the problem of aging, and the opportunity for aging, the, the, the great news of aging, there is no solution unless you act on two fronts at the same time. Migration only is not good enough to fill the deficit of workforce. Working with pensions and increasing pension age is not good enough in itself to deal with this problem. You need both. And I don't think there are that many European countries to ready to acknowledge that. And even if they are ready to acknowledge it, it will be a tacit acknowledge in the back, acknowledgement in the back room, not an open acknowledgement in front of the public, including the public from countries that are absolutely bound to send millions and millions of migrants, because otherwise the world is not going to develop and survive. This is all in absence of climate change. This is all in the context of income differentials and demographic transition. But if we add the challenge of climate change to that, that is becoming even more difficult, challenging, but also having enormous opportunities ahead down the line, gain migration, because um, climate change is, a is emerging slowly but steadily as an increasing factor that drives mobility of people. It can affect income generation, it can generate inhability, habitability in many parts of the world. So it is increasingly we see it as something that, uh, that drives migration. And then when you look at what's happening nowadays, we see one billion people living, in fact, in low-lying cities and settlements that are at risk from coastal climate impacts by 2050. And those people will not be able, and their descendants, to be in the same, in the same situation. Climate change affects not only the numbers of migrants, it affects also who migrates, because the impact is differentiated between uh, men and women. And uh, it may also, unfortunately, lead to an increase uh, uh, the number of distressed movements, movements out of necessity. You know, thinking about migration, rem remittances and, and, and refugees, we're always in this, we're often in this space where we try to analytically to be very exact by distinguishing between economic migration and forced displacement. But then when it comes really to reality, this distinction doesn't hold well because refugees become economic migrants and remittances are sent by both migrants and refugees. And remittances 
beginning last year, became a bigger amount of money worldwide than the sum of overseas development assistance and uh, foreign direct investment. So FDI and ODA together do not match the amount remittances sent worldwide. Can you imagine how important is the role of migration and the function of migration, which are remittances? Uh, coming back uh, in the end to the issue of green development and adoption to climate change in the migration context, uh, it seems to me, and we see it very clearly in the, in the World Bank, that international cooperation can enhance the match between workers' skills and attributes and the needs of the destination economies uh, while reducing some of, the, some of the adverse effects of what is often called, even though I don't like the term, the brain drain. The brain then is often just a rational allocation of human capital, but I fully appreciate the perceived losses of sending countries. But this is why we need to work together, and I think the role of IOM and our role as the World Bank is fundamental here to create channels of safe, regular migration that may and does often include the element of coming back to the country of sending. It doesn't have to, but often does, because it is important that those migrants uh, contribute to the development both of countries of destination and countries of, or of origin. The second very important thing in that process, which would be in the vision I'm trying to outline very much, uh, enhanced by great cooperation between international organizations, including IOM and the World Bank, but the second element so important is substantive involvement of the private sector. That will only happen, successful migration for somebody who is in the working age must end with a job. That job in nine out of ten cases will be a job with the private sector. So. At this very moment when we are discussing it, when we have the great event, as Amy put it, the biggest event in town, right? This week in Geneva, which is actually very already a tall order because Geneva has lots of events every week. But if we, if, if we do that, it's important to remember that, uh, that we need experimenting here because we don't know how to bring private sector. It's not natural to them. Private employers do not know migrants. And I would like to report to you that uh, in the World Bank, we have been trying to foster a successful global skills partnership pilots. One of them was between Germany and Morocco. Similar schemes were later followed by Belgian employers. We need to do much more of that. Philippines, the Philippines is another country, a great example of establishing successful bilateral agreements for productive legal migration pathways across many economies and, and sector. So I think it is critical that private sector is brought to the solution of how to meet the opportunity of migration and remittances in a positive way. To sum up, let me just finish with three conclusions. Uh, that in order to make labor mobility and opportunity to also being able to address the challenge of climate migration, we need to address three core principles. And the first principle is investing in human capital. The higher is the human capital of those who are about to migrate, the better for, for them and the better for the places that will receive them. That's why in the World Bank we do have, many of you would know this, a human capital project when we try both to measure and encourage countries to invest in human capital. Uh, we want to do it because it contributes to productivity, because human capital is good in itself, but it's also critically important to successful migration, which is inevitable, as I was trying to establish. The second element is that we need actually managed, systematic international labor migration intermediation system. And that system needs to absolutely transcend the boundaries of the countries. It cannot be held hostage to narrow interests even of big countries in the world. It needs to be truly international. And I'm happy to say that in Geneva, in the presence of, of, of a DG of IOM, because who else than IOM should play absolutely leading role in setting up this system of managed international labor market intermediation system. And then we need constructive global dialogue and partnerships, which need to bring really private sector in a big way as it is all not going to end up well without the major role of private sector employers. So in this context, let me finish by saying, 
Uh, I think we have been elevating the importance of migration for development in the World Bank to the level which is un unprecedented. Many of you would know that we have this annual publication called the World Development Report, and the last one we had was first time in the history of the World Bank on migration. And thank you. I also am very happy about that. And then, and then, uh, and then, in our work in many country programs, we are increasingly featuring migration as a very important factor of development. For instance, this year, the World Bank is committed to support the establishment of ten global skills partnerships covering different sectors, including potentially those who are highly relevant for the green economy. So many thanks for your invitation, and I, I, I'd like to declare to you that if anything, migration will be playing absolutely more and more critical role every year in the development agenda of the World Bank. And as long as I'm with the World Bank, I will do my best to support it and to put my best efforts into making the success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I'm grateful to call upon Khulud bin Mansour, the African Youth Ambassador for Peace of the African Union, now fueled by her dedication to gender equity and diplomatic relations. Bin Mansour is an activist dedicated to advocating for women and children's rights in Tunisia. Now, Khalud was, organized, uh, was recognized for her activism through multiple awards, too many to count on stage, please forgive me. Uh, several uh, NGOs that she's worked with. She is a UNDP SDG camp alumni and a UN Women Peace Builders and mediator. And in her spare time, she works. <laughs> please uh, make your keynote speech, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished guests, esteemed youth participants, and members of civil society. My name is Khuloud Ben Mansour. I'm the African Union's Youth Ambassador for Peace. I stand before you today with a profound sense of responsibility and urgency as we gather here in Geneva for the International Dialogue on Migration a pivotal moment to address the interconnected challenges and opportunities of our time, youth, migration, and climate change. In this era of global interdependence, we find ourselves at the crossroads of demographic shifts and environmental crisis. It is our privilege and solemn duty to deliberate upon the triple nexus that encapsulates the realities faced by youth of today, who will bear the brunt of decisions made or neglected in this pivotal moment of history. Youth, the driven force of innovation, inspiration and transformation, are not only the torch bearers of our future, but also the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. They are the ones will inherit the consequences of our collective actions or inactions. Their aspirations, hopes, and dreams are closely tied to the health of our planet and the freedom to seek better opportunities beyond their borders. The question here, is migration a solution to the climate risks youth are confronted with? In my own perspective, it is. As we gather within the walls of diplomacy, let us remember that it's our responsibility to pave the way for a sustainable, equitable, and just future. Our responsibility and the discussions here must transcend mere trotic, translating into concrete actions that safeguard the rights, well-being, and future prospects of the world's youth. Youth engagement, empowerment, and inclusion into climate action are not optional, but imperative. Their voices, experiences, and perspectives must be at the forefront of our discourse.
guiding our policies and actions. We must empower them with the knowledge and resources to adapt to the challenges posed by a change in climate and to foster resilience in the face of migration's complex dynamics. Our shared commitment to these issues necessitates collaboration across borders, generations, and sectors. It demands that the channel of collective wisdom, resources, and influence to address the root causes of youth migration, mitigate the impacts of climate change, and create pathways for sustainable development. In closing, I implore each one of us to leave this dialogue with a renewed dedication to building a world where the dreams of youth are not thwarted by climate-induced hardships, but nurtured and realized. Let us work together to ensure that the triple nexus of youth, migration, and climate change becomes a nexus of hope, opportunity, and progress. I look forward to the fruitful discussions and impactful outcomes that will emanate from our time here in Geneva I'm confident in the insightful interventions we will be hearing and the great outcome that will be delivered after this dialogue. I commend you for your devotion and dedication and uh, your involvement to this cause. And I salute every one of you for thinking about the future, not only for the youth of today, but for the, for the generations of tomorrow. Thank you. As rare and unbelievable as it is, we have some time. So I will fill it, perhaps. My journalistic instinct is kicking in, and if you have uh, the, just a few moments here, I may ask you and just talk to you a little bit about the contributions that you have made. Can I make myself comfortable? Thank you very much. I feel like Oprah. So the first question then, um, I heard everything that you had to say and in summation it seems we are talking as much about the opportunities that are before us as the challenges ahead. DG Pope, if I may come to you first, what did you take away from the other keynote speeches that you think we should take on into the rest of our day? All right, so there are three angles we need to be working on together, right? The first is we need to come up with solutions for people who've already been displaced. We know that millions of people are already on the move as a result of climate change. I was recently in northern Kenya where I had the opportunity to visit Dadaab, which many of you know is one of the largest refugee camps in the world. Over the last two years, 100,000 more people have crossed from Somalia into Kenya, largely because of drought. Right? So we need solutions for the communities who have already been displaced. We then need to find solutions for people to be able to stay in place, right? That means looking at communities that are most likely to be displaced in the future and proactively engaging and driving interventions that will allow them to be more resilient in the face of climate change. And finally, and th this is where I'm very, very excited about the work that the World Bank is doing, we need solutions for people in the future. We can now predict in many cases communities that are now agricultural, for example, or are fishers or have other um, uh, ties to the land who will no longer be able to make a living in the future. We should now be proactively identifying solutions for those communities, investments in skills training, investments in regular pathways, and ensuring that the people who will no longer have a job in several years time will be able to, be, to find a job and to be matched with that job wherever it exists in the world. Thank you, DG. Uh, Mr. Kautsky, if I may ask you, you, you mentioned a few things that I think I found quite surprising coming from you in a, in a brilliant way. I know, it doesn't seem it. Maybe I'm just not in this world enough. I don't know. You mentioned the idea of migration and migrants being an opportunity for this sector. One thing that I think came from your contributions is this idea of an infrastructure needing to be developed, both in a soft and in hard form, in order to facilitate turning migration and migrants 
into people who work in jobs and are able to prosper. Talk to us a little bit about that, because I'm, I love the idea. I am not sure yet what would be the right governance of that structure, but it's absolutely needed, because the opportunity of migration transcends boundaries of countries and transcends continents, and uh, there is a need for a global leadership here, and I think there is time to think very seriously about it. That was what, on top of my mind. People migrated always, except that it started with very small scale migration that we would uh, now call, uh, you know, rural to urban within the country, secondary cities, then primary cities, then international. But we're in a different world as a result of the globalization. And I very much like what Amy just said, the distinction between the stock and flow. Economists always like those distinctions, <laughs> stock and flow. There is a stock of migrants, we need to take care of them first. And this is fundamental, it needs to happen now. And then I do know policymakers in many countries who are afraid that if they do it successfully, that will encourage other migrants. Yes. But that's exactly what needs to happen. Because you need those other migrants to come. So there is nothing wrong with you actually getting it sorted out for existing migrants. That's why that, that's, that, this is the critical link here. Yes. And I do know how difficult it is to do it. I, I studied very carefully my own country. I am from Poland, how we accommodated Ukrainian refugees. I was just in Turkey, I said. We discussed so much how they accommodated Syrian uh, refugees. These are different local problems, but the commitment to make the stock work, that those people are happy, find productive jobs is there, solved through different ways given international, internal legislation. My sense is really we do need an approach a la international, transnational, global government to migration issues because the role and the need for migration for development is huge, cannot be stopped and it cannot be solved at the level of local governments given political impediments and entanglements. So, so from that perspective, I just said, what, what I said was to offer to you, using the example of World Development Report, the World Bank is ready here to help in that process in, to the extent we can. As I am sure many of our colleagues uh, are here in front of me and those of you who are watching online. Khalid, if I might come to you. Um, I want to specifically focus on the role of young people because all too often, we just think that you'll solve it. Whatever problem it may be, oh well, the youth will figure it out. Um, you will inherit a world that is perhaps precarious when it comes to the idea of climate change and migration. How, as a young person, <laughs> how do you see the two being interconnected? And do you think it's useful that we um, sort of merge our understanding of what climate change is with the idea of migration and the migration of people? Um, very good question. I think um, today there is a new concept that it's called the climate-induced migration because we understand that uh, people are no longer migrating for the classical uh, roots or for the classical approaches that we tend to hear about but more there are more more consequences and events that are happening that are making young people tend to migrate that is armed conflict climate change uh, and many other uh, factors of course but i think today here the role of youth should uh, reflect not only the um, i would say the perception that we used to see as migration being a negative term, but also to explore the opportunities that might come out of it. Uh, and also, of course, highlight the uh, importance of incorporating them in decision making, because we need more young people being out there and being vocal about these issues. Um, of course, um, I would definitely encourage that we start looking at migration as a positive element and contributing more to uh, the economic empowerment uh, and the development aspects. It's, it's wonderful and noble to think of migration as a positive impact, but many of our colleagues in this room know of its challenges. Yes. There needs to be a sense of perhaps realism, not only realism in approach, but uh, sort of big-minded and, and hopeful in our, in our perspective, it seems. This is what I'm getting from my panel here. Thank you so much for le letting me uh, rattle through your brain and your, and your keynote speeches. A round of applause, please. Stay where you are, uh, Didi.
I'm keeping you hostage because you've got the best view of the entire show. So you stay, you stay exactly where you are. Now we move on uh, to the next part of the show. Uh, we are here to now talk with the highlights from three of the pre-IDM regional dialogues. Now, what is this? Well, just prior to this event, uh, we had uh, folks coming together in different regions around the world in order to talk about what challenges and what possibilities and opportunities lay ahead. So for the first time, the IDM promotes seven, national, uh, seven regional dialogues across the Americas, the North, Central and South Americas, Middle East and North Africa, Southern, East uh, and the Horn of Africa, West and Central Africa, the Asia and Pacific, and the European Economic Area, the EU and NATO, and Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. I'd say that's the world, but I'm sure that's not politically correct. Um, I'd like first to call to rise the IOM Regional Director for South America, Marcello Pisani, to provide some highlights on the pre-IDM regional dialogues. Where are you? <laughs> oh my goodness, who are you? There should be one for you, yes, ready and waiting. We are welcoming Michelle Klein-Solomon, who was our regional director for Central America and North America. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, Marcelo and I agreed that I would speak first, so we will share this presentation. I'm not stepping on his toes. Mucho gusto a mis colegas y todos los amigos de América Latina. Es un gran gusto. Greeting to all my colleagues from Latin America. I'm glad to talk to you. And now. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. It is a great pleasure to be here and to share with you what we're doing at the regional level on human mobility and climate change. And I can tell you this is a key priority for us. Gracias, Profesor. That's a lot easier. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes? yes, I can. Okay, perfect. That's a lot easier. Good morning, everybody. Now I can see all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you and to share a bit what we're doing in the Americas. And this is a joint presentation. Uh, and Marcelo will take the floor in just a minute. The Americas, of course, is a very diverse region. We have four sub-regions in the Americas. We have Central America, we have South America, we have North America and the Caribbean. And what that means is we have very diverse experiences with climate change, its impacts on human mobility. So for example, El Corredor Seco in Central America is very different from the experience of the small island states in the Caribbean. Corridor Seco is having a long-term drought that is affecting productivity and the ability to live safe and productive lives in farming. In the Caribbean, sea level rise, increasing hurricanes, typhoons, all of those kinds of weather events are displacing large numbers of people. And in North America, you would have all seen the increase of forest fires that, of course, know no developmental or geographical boundaries. You're gonna see a lot of that here. The key message is we're already engaging governments of the region, civil society, youth actors, other stakeholders, and they have heard your call, Amy DG Pope. They have heard your call. They're ready to take action. They're ready to bring their particular commitments and resources to the table. They're already adapting policies, and they are ready to do more. So that's the key message. Can I, can I give it the well, floor the to real myself? Yes, will the real Marcello Pisani please stand up? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Marcelo Pisani. Uh, buenos días a mis colegas y representantes de. Good morning to my colleagues and representatives from South America. Americans and, and the Caribbean have become a region of innovation on climate mobility. Civil society groups are mobilizing to carry out a strategic litigations on climate change and human mobility. Governments uh, are relocating people at risk, offering visas for persons affected by disaster and integrating mobility in their national adaptation plans. While, re while regional entities identify and apply best practices for humanitarian admission and protection. Looking forward, we need to continue the work, do more 
and do it better. Mm -hmm. Innovate and thoughtfully policies need to be implemented and monitored. The human rights of vulnerable communities and people on the move must be placed at the forefront of the conversations. We also have progress to make in bringing youth groups and the private sector to the discussion how was mentioned. We are grateful for the opportunity to bring regional messages to such an important gathering as the International Dialogue on Migration. We are also thankful for the large rep representation of participants from the region who will intervene during these two days. We believe that solutions and challenges that we are witnessing in the Americas and the Caribbean can make great contribution to the global conversation on climate change and human mobility. Thank you very much. And so, to their three-minute video demonstrating all of this. In 2017, we had the Category 5 Hurricane Maria. Me, personally, I lost my roofing for my home, and, uh, as well as some other neighbors as well. In that time, it affected us all. The trees came to here, the water Yes, it, we were affected. It was a total disaster. We were really scared. People didn't know where to run. Children didn't know what to do. high mountain areas to small island states and coastlines, from arid regions to tropical rainforests, communities in Latin America and the Caribbean are highly affected by the adverse impacts of climate change. In 2023, IOM organized multiple consultations with governments civil society, private sector, academia, and affected communities to discuss regional priorities on human mobility and climate change. Five key messages emerged from these discussions. First, bringing governmental agencies together with civil society actors is crucial for the governance of climate mobility. Affected communities require multi-layered support to prevent displacement and receive adequate assistance when on the move. Their participation in the design of adequate solutions is fundamental. Human rights, climate justice, and loss of damage are fundamental to action on climate mobility in Latin America and the Caribbean. Climate change is already causing harm for people across the hemisphere. Upholding their rights and addressing loss and damage is crucial for governments and populations alike. Safe and regular mobility pathways can be the critical factor in saving lives and moving people out of harm's way. Climate change will increasingly influence mobility. The availability of dignified pathways will make a key difference for people to move in safe ways. Forward-looking evidence on climate mobility is a priority, but many gaps remain. Involving affected communities to mobilize local knowledge is an important way to understand gaps in protection and improve action. Transparency and participation on climate mobility must include youth and the private sector. Youth participation should be a pillar of renewed engagement in climate mobility. Good practices in private sector engagement can be leveraged across the region. Putting communities at the forefront of our response is key for success on climate mobility. Addressing the impacts of the climate emergency on human mobility is not an option. It is an obligation, and it's an obligation now. Thank you. Michelle Klein-Solomon and uh, Marcelo Pisani there. Thank you very much. Forgive me. Now, moving on, I want to hear from the Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific, Sarah Liu uh, Ariola, to provide some highlights on their pre-IDM regional dialogue. Where are you? I'm I can't. There you, oh, here. right, they're next to each other. Okay. Someone's thought this through. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates. Um, let me talk about the Asia and the Pacific. The Asia and the Pacific is home to more than um, 2 billion youth. That's 54% of the youth in the whole world. And they are under 30. 
And also, over the past 60 years, temperatures in Asia and the Pacific have risen um, faster than the global mean. According to World Risk Index, seven out of the 10 countries that are in the top 10 um, of the world at risk are in Asia and the Pacific. It's worth noting that last September 29, we had the opportunity to invite over 100 young people in Miriam College in the Institute of Environmental Studies for the Asia Pacific Youth Summit and Climate Change and Human Mobility. This is the first time in Asia and the Pacific in the region. It was an opportunity for them to amplify their voices regarding their needs, concerns, and recommendations related to the intersections of climate change, environment, and migration. The Youth Summit was, high, um, was hosted by IOM in partnership with Miriam College, the Migration Youth and Children Platform, and the NGO Upholding Life and Nature. It was very refreshing to see the youth and to have their voice. Um, as the impacts of climate change intensify, more and more people will be on the move in the future and in some cases, repeatedly. Migration can amplify challenges faced by the youth such as family separation and dangers linked to migration through irregular channels. However, such human mobility can also offer new opportunities for adapting to the impacts of climate change through skills development and work and educational opportunities. Mm. Despite the challenges, young people are the most powerful agents of change that we need in this world to promote climate action and greener economies. They are also capable of raising awareness about disaster reduction and climate change adaptation and of building resilience to adverse climate change impacts in their communities. Youth represent an immense source of energy, inspiration for the future. So ladies and gentlemen, we show to you the highlights of the summit. Thank you. From towering mountain ranges of the Himalayas to island communities in the Pacific, the Asia-Pacific region is grappling with the stark reality of climate change and its impacts on human mobility. In 2022, the region accounted for 70% of all disaster-related displacements worldwide. But for the young people in Asia and the Pacific, climate change isn't just a statistic or a topic of conversation. It's an urgent call for action. On the heels of the Regional Ministerial Roundtable on Migration, Environment, and Climate Change, sponsored by the Government of the Philippines and IOM, on the sidelines of the 78th UN General Assembly, we also hosted the Asia-Pacific Youth Summit on Climate Change and Human Mobility with various partners including the Migration Youth and Children Platform and Miriam College. The Youth Summit brought together over 100 young people across Asia-Pacific to discuss their specific needs, concerns, and recommendations regarding human mobility and climate action. The summit also showcased the achievements and good practices of young people across the region, which will provide crucial inputs to COP28 and other upcoming events, particularly the United Nations Summit of the Future in 2024 and the regional reviews of the Global Compact for Migration. As young people around the world continue to demand climate action, the IOM Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific is supporting youth-led initiatives and innovative solutions. In the face of adversity, our youth's perspective, creativity, and determination are the keys to accelerating climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. Sarah, can I just uh, pick you up on one, one, one thing? Uh, your video and most of what you've said is specifically focused on the impact it, that, it, that it is, how impactful it is to have young people participate. It's also challenging. Uh, it's difficult to listen to young people. They have a lot to say. <laughs> how do you manage that? How do you manage uh, sort of, in some senses, bending or breaking those older, more traditional forms of doing things in order to achieve new, innovative ways of achieving, uh, achieving what you want? You know, I think it's most enriching because uh, they are the ones who tell us that um, for the first time, people are listening to them. They are not, uh, it's uh, for the youth and by the youth and actually they, they design the whole process. And it's also they're saying that 
um, they, they are not considered as experts, but their experiences should be also considered as ex expertise. It's the first time that uh, I heard people who said that they were afraid to drown in their own bedrooms. So we have to listen because the policies, and some of them said that the only way they can move things forward is they want to engage in politics and make the policies for their own countries. Wow. I don't think I've ever heard young people saying that they want to engage in politics quite so much, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to hear it. Now, I'm eager to hear an update from the Regional Director for West and Central Africa. Christopher Gaskin, please, could you stand up? And before, before we get to your video, what, what I'd like you to, to discuss, perhaps rather than what we're about to see, is what you think the, what, what the rest of us in this room need to know from your experiences of listening in this instance. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, Christopher Gascon, the Re regional director for Central and West Africa. Uh, Christopher Gascon, je, je vous uh, remercie tous d'être ici, et particulièrement Thank you les représentants very much de notre région. Thank you uh, for welcoming uh, uh, here well, all the participants well, from I our region. To, to my points, uh, I'd like to say that what we have in, in Africa is the fastest growing continent, the fastest growing youth population in the world. and. Uh, how do you listen to these people is not so simple, but we do have to create opportunities for them uh, to listen, to have fora and, uh, and have their, their inputs. But right now their input is moving one way or the other. And a lot of people are seeking our assistance and finding regular pathways, but a lot of others are not. And we are, we are facing a great number of people in distress having to save people in the desert, having to save people at sea. And if we don't actually start listening to them very closely, we're going to have much more of that. Please continue with your remarks and then to your video. Well, thank you. Uh, climate change in, uh, in the Western Central Africa region is varied and uh, affects different subregions in different ways. The Sahel, for one, the coastal countries, uh, in, in other ways uh, for erosion or aridity uh, and is creating a, um, a massive move towards urban areas. So the fact that people are leaving their communities is already one problem. The fact that they are now amassing in the urban areas is another problem. So we have to, we have to uh, address this. And as a, um, as a first uh, event and in preparation for today, the regional office in Western Central Africa held a, a regional dialogue on migration on last Tuesday uh, ahead of this uh, international dialogue on migration. The online event gathered civil society, organization, governments and donors, representatives, youth and the media from across the region and registered more than 100 participants. On the occasion of this preliminary event, representatives from the private sector uh, climate finance, youth and pastoralist communities discussed next steps following the expansion of the Kampala Ministerial Declaration on Migration, Environment and Climate Change. This, they also highlighted the importance of adopting an inclusive and whole of society approach in addressing climate induced mobility. This exchange offered an opportunity to explore climate finance accessibility in the region and gather insights on best practices involving the private sector, communities related to green energy, transhumance, and diaspora inclusion. If we want to act today, access to climate finance has to be facilitated and both private sector and diaspora from the region have a pivotal role to play, mm -hmm. including on the development of nature-based solutions and green jobs for youth. Thank you. So now let's see the video from the region. We can no longer dissociate human mobility from climate change, especially in Western Central Africa. The Internal Displacement and Monitoring Center reports that by the end of 2022, this region accounted for over one million persons displaced by events such as storms, floods, and landslides. By 2050, this region is expected to be the most impacted by rapid urbanization with the World Bank forecasting that over 32 million people will be compelled to move within their own countries unless climate action is taken and inclusive development implemented. These figures could further rise as they do not take into account rapid onset disasters, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
it's time to act. Congratulations are owed to governments of the region for their formulation and signing of the Continental Kampala Declaration on Migration, Environment and Climate Change. This is the first government-led, comprehensive and action-oriented framework that addresses climate-induced mobility issues. Solutions do exist and are being implemented at the community level. Nature-based responses such as agroecology, agroforestry, renewable energies are being tested on the ground and need to be scaled up, counting on climate financing which has to come. Strong partnerships are vital. IOM collaborates with the UN Working Group on Climate Change, Environment Security and Development for West Africa. Also with the Regional Network for Migration, and recently hosted a regional dialogue to harness the creativity and dynamic responses of partners. We must rise to the challenge and act now for tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Christopher Gascon there. I just wanted to, if, if I may, uh, ask uh, our two colleagues there um, uh, to, to possibly have a bit more of a, of a comment. Marcelo and Michelle, if, if I could just ask you, in summation, from all of the contribution I have seen from, from, from the different regions, we're hearing the beginnings of a collaboration forming. The regional dialogues are incredibly important, but you seem to be coming across the same sort of hurdles. There is a collective uh, struggle here that needs to be addressed, as well as the deeply individualistic regional ones. So. That's a long-winded way of saying, what are you doing with each other? Are you talking? Are you collaborating? And in what sense? Whichever of you wants to answer, please do. Maybe I'll start and I'm sure Marcelo will follow. So we are collaborating, certainly for the Americas, and I forgot to mention, gracias al gobierno de Colombia, we will have a regional, a hemispheric dialogue, the 7th and 8th of November on climate change mobility. I'm happy to stand up if that's better. So 7th and 8th of November, gracias al gobierno de Colombia, vamos a tener un discurso para todo... We are going to celebrate a global forum on migration and climate change. And there we will take into account the different ideas and perspectives from the government from all around the world, and we will prepare contributions before the COP28. This will be of paramount importance. And of course, we partner with members from other regions. This is also extremely important. All this with the aim to share lessons learned and see how we can all together work in order to broaden the scope of our partnerships. For example, let me give you an example. I just learned something from Sarah. And of course, we're going to share her experience to our region. And we are going to mobilize more and more partners. This would be, in a nutshell, my perspective on the topic. Not, in not. English, please. We don't, okay. We're not quick enough to grab the headphones. No, we're no, not as young as we once were. Spanish. Um, well, within the region, we are uh, in this moment constructing a regional vision within the South American Conference on Migration. So in, 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 in these mechanisms, we hold, we have a network on, on climate change, uh, uh, environment and migration. So this is an opportunity to create a strategy on climate change for the region. I mean, we have done things in the region, but we need a more comprehensive approach. We also have a project to strengthening the capacity of our countries to create data. We need also a strategy on data. So we, we have to move from a reactive way to a more comprehensive approach to the needs uh, to uh, confront the challenges of climate change. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you to both of them. A round of applause for our first group of pre-IDM regional directors. I'm going to uh, swiftly move over here and bring the questions back to, to you three, if I may, just with the, with, with the time that we have. So, DG Pope, first to you. You're hearing from your regional directors saying that they need more uh, sort of 
they are listening, but now they need to turn that into action. So what have you, you've been in the job six days. I'm not expecting a comprehensive plan. I really am not. But in what ways are you motivated and how are you challenging your team to be able to do the impossible, take the small into the large, uh, listen to the individual and act for the many? So first of all, I'm really excited that our regional directors are here with us today. This is um, a new approach that we are trying out because I have heard from so many of you here in Geneva that you don't necessarily know the scope of our work um, in your countries. So having um, the bridge between what we're saying and doing here in Geneva and what is happening out in the rest of the world um, is the first step. But the second step is how can we use uh, the fora that we have in Geneva to drive the global consensus. Mm -hmm. You've heard about the Kampala Declaration, which has now been signed on to by over 30 countries within Africa. We've heard about the Pacific Mobility Framework, which will be signed on to, we hope, in a month's time. Um, we've heard about work that's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, but we haven't yet heard the global consensus. So that's where um, all of our ambassadors who are in the room, our colleagues who are representing member states, that's your opportunity to build out the global consensus that climate change is impacting communities, is displacing communities, and that solutions are needed to address it. Perfect. Uh, Khalid, if I may come to you. A lot of chat about young people. I love it. I'm energized by it. It's something that I'm deeply committed to uh, personally. But is there, is there a way, other than just being heard, I suppose, um, uh, I think one of, one of the regional directors mentioned, I'm going to say it again, young people wanting to get into politics about climate change. Is there a way for, for that particular group, for the youth uh, across the world, to be able to bring a politics of change that focuses not only on the climate crisis and migration as separate problems and opportunities around the world, but also as a way of merging them to deal with them together? What is the youth vibe? <laughs> I think absolutely there is a way to create the change that youth want today and we have seen live examples from the videos and allow me to uh, congratulate you for the work that you have been doing it's really amazing and it gives me also hope that there are uh, such channels for young people to speak up and to reflect the context in which they are uh, living and the challenges they are confronted with now for the ways how youth can actually speak up or perhaps transfer their concerns, I think it shouldn't only stop about being, them being in politics. Um, the change is there, they are creating the spaces that they want, however, I think it shouldn't just stop about listening to them or having them speak. You know, we can give youth a seat at the table, but that doesn't mean that we give them the opportunity. I think that today what we need to see is concrete action, realistic uh, and concrete actions being taken and having um, the real opportunities created for them, maybe more inclusion into the policy making spheres so that it incorporates this diversified vision, including that of youth and marginalized groups. Michael, if I may come to you, there's a lot of food for thought there, a lot of opportunity. At the World Bank, you, data was mentioned a few times and this is what I wanted to sort of get your opinion on, your views on. Data is power, and it certainly can be the driving force for change, but the right type of data in the right hands. As we all know, the wrong type of data in the wrong hands can cause untold problems, uh, can add to um, perhaps negative ways of dealing with this problem or a, a perspective that isn't accurate but is falsely supported by data. So with that in mind, uh, what do you at the World Bank think about this idea of data when it comes to, to, to merging the concepts of migration and climate crisis? It's absolutely fundamental. We are lucky in the World Bank to host an international brain trust named NOMAD, and many of uh, governments and many of you contribute to that, and we are proud of having, in our view, accurate and sometimes extremely insightful data about uh, developments in the field of migration and remittances earlier 
Today, I shared with you the fact that the amount of uh, remittances last year worldwide were bigger than foreign direct investment and overseas development assistance together. We wouldn't have known that without mm -hmm. having NOMAD, and we wouldn't have had NOMAD without many international partners coming together with us in, in the World Bank. Ourselves only would not be capable of creating that brain trust and be able to have an access to the data that are quite illuminating and, in fact, quite fundamental when you think how people live. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Second, uh, what I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, I worked a lot in the area of social protection and a lot of that is G2P, government to people transfers. But P2P, people to people transfers, remittances, are bigger than that, are so fundamentally so, okay, so, important uh, for Forgive my interruption. Yes. Let me make sure I understand you. Are you saying that when, for example, I'm from Afghanistan, I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan in 1988. I fled the war in my country, uh, a gender-based war in my country. As, as a youth, I had no choice in the country. I came to the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom now benefits massively from my contributions, not uh, by my civic duties that I enact, but by my uh, devotion to, to where I'm from, uh, to the United Kingdom, and, and um, uh, my, my contributions socially. So I guess my question to you is, how do we what, what data point do I represent? I mean, how do I get measured? Refugees and migrants often are, are brought into this situation and talked about hand in hand. Um, and you, and you, you chose not, to, you chose to dismiss, or perhaps look past the distinction of an economic migrant and a refugee earlier. I just want to build on that. How can data be useful to us if we choose to have these silos that are ineffective? But the biggest challenge in your example is, what do we know about the money you send back to your, the place you came from. Exactly. Because it's very hard, without getting to central bank statistics, it's very hard to actually be accurate about this data. That's why I was talking about NOMAD as being a brain trust that helps us to build evidence that otherwise would not exist. If you allow me to say two more points, because I heard regional directors from IOM speaking, I thought it was terrific. Two points I wanted to make is most of migration worldwide happens south to south in our traditional way of thinking about development, not south to north, but the politics of the migration dialogue is often driven by south to north because of concerns of countries in Europe, US and elsewhere about migration, seeing it more as a challenge than opportunity. And the second thing, which I thought was, it's so, I'm, I'm so impressed that you, you know, that you have together regional directors in the IOM. It is so important also, however, to have a very keen eye on migration that transcends regional uh, development. There is so much, we are now setting up a small migration center in Rome, and we see how much migration into Europe comes from all over the world and cannot be limited regionally. A lot of migration to Spain will be coming from Latin America. So having this global outlook and realizing that most of migration remains still south to south, I think it's a very important discovery for our clear thinking about uh, the opportunities of migration in the future. Thank you, Michael. And I'm noticing DG Pope nodding vigorously in agreement, so we should take that into consideration as well. Stay exactly where you are. Uh, because there's a lot to ponder and lots to take in of what we've heard so far and a lot to reflect on. Why not do it with another musical interlude? I'd like to welcome back the talents of Julia Saar to sing another song to get us thinking. Ansa tomla fale humba gune juduna waegi suluba ngenti ulama johuloma se santa nurumala. There is the fall for Sader Samadella Why Nanguloma Pus you much a Pus be much on ye Do coha Yo do coha 
jahren alle her, wie man nicht kennt, har man sonnen gewartet, wie hilgel Was mir bejachle, was bin mir tonje, do kocham, ja und do kocham. Was bin mir tonje, was bin mir tonje, ja und do kocham, ja und do kocham. Ja bot, Halleluja. Je peux vous dire que mes chansons, c'est une géographie des sentiments et des souvenirs. Are about uh, memories, Africa to Europe. C'est tout un trajet, c'est un trajet de vie, c'est un chemin. Of course, a journey, a life journey. Avant de vous laisser, je voudrais. And before leaving you, c'est un défi, c'est un challenge. I would like you to sing. Vous êtes d'accord? This is a challenge, and this is like a Wolof class. You ready? Cet après-midi, nous allons faire des musiques avec. There will be some music as well with Fred Soul. Et là, donc, il faudra chanter. But une petite répétition pour cet après-midi. Let's go. It's a kind of a rehearsal for this afternoon. Dara, you can repeat after me. Dara. Dara, Ludul, Ludul, Yo, Yo, Dara, Dara, Ludul, Yudul, Yo, 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 Dara, Ludul, You can all do, you can all do it. You just have to follow me. Okay. Alors ça fait Dara, Ludul, Yo. C'est juste ça que vous aurez à chanter. Ça va? That's all you have to sing. So you can do it. Dara, Ludul, Yo. Alors à vous. Dara, Ludul, Yo. Et moi je ferai Sahla Oma Dara Ludu Yao. Et vous Dara Yudu Yao. Plus. Hein On va faire aussi une classe de. I can't hear everyone here. Come on. Une classe de une classe de Wolof. We can do it. Dara Ludu Yao. Dara Yudu Yao. Sahla Oma Dara Ludu Yao. Dara Yudu Yao. I'm here with you, Metina. I'm here with you, Metina. Dara, you do you. Will my buy you? Will my buy you? Dara, you do you. Plus fort, s'il vous plaît, avant que je m'en aille. I'm here with you, Metina. A little louder, please. Dara, you do you. Yo. Yo. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you later. Thank you, Julia Sar, for that uh, uh, beautiful voice and also for helping us exercise our beautiful voices. You may have noticed I chose not to sing. That is my prerogative. I can do so. Uh, now, I believe that we have an intervention from the floor. Who? Where are they? Are they? I can't see them, I believe. Sorry, but bear with me one moment. Okay. So first I must ask my lovely panel to please leave the podium as I continue the show. Sorry, I got carried away with Julia. What have you done to me? I've been mesmerized. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our first panel. Thank you so much. Please take your seats. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. <laughs> we didn't rehearse that bit. Could you tell? So I do believe that there is an intervention from the floor. Uh, could they please stand up? Uh, and make their points in less than two minutes. Where are they? Do we have comments? Where are we? Philippines, you're next. Stand by. Hold the line caller. 
Hungry, where are you? The Minister for Foreign Affairs for Hungary, are you, are you making remarks? Second shot, going twice. Gone. Moving swiftly on to the Philippines, please could you stand up uh, and make your intervention. If you'd like to stay seated, please do so. Yes. Thank you, madam. Uh, actually, the Philippines is delivering the statement on behalf of the 33 champion countries of the global compact for migration. So, uh, well, to our distinguished panelists, including uh, Director General Amy Pope, uh, excellencies and colleagues, uh, the champion countries congratulate Ms. Pope on her assumption as the Director General of the IOM and assure her of our support in steering forward the IOM and the international community's shared vision of implementing the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and regulation, Regular Migration. We also express our gratitude to the able leadership of the former Director General, Mr. Antonio Vitorino. So we support this theme, this session's theme, of continuing to explore the nexus between human mobility and climate change. This is especially uh, relevant as the community, international community has acknowledged the adverse effects of climate change, environmental degradation, and natural dis disasters as among the drivers of migration. Uh, we reiterate the guidelines outlined in the GCM, particularly on objectives two, five, and 23, on addressing the interactions between human mobility and climate change. We highlight the need for urgent actions to adapt to and mitigate the adverse effects of climate change, as well as to address loss and damage which may compel people to leave their countries of origin. So this includes investing in programs that accelerate the state's fulfillment of the SDG goals, strengthening joint analysis and information sharing, developing adaptation and resilience strategies, integrating displacement considerations, harmonizing and developing approaches and mechanisms at sub-regional and regional levels, and developing coherent approaches to address the challenges of migration movements in the context of sudden onset and slow onset natural disasters. So we urge the international community to cooperate in identifying, developing, and strengthening comprehensive solutions for migrants compelled to leave their countries of origin to these slow onset natural disasters and to the, due to the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation. We underscore the importance of increasing international and regional cooperation to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 agenda for the SDGs. We believe this is the decisive moment to shape our understanding and approach on the interface of climate, environment, and mobility. So, we have the opportunity for this constructive dialogue and cooperation and to realize the vision of the GZM on climate change and mobility. We recognize this, how this nexus interlink, interlinks with other conventions and we need to focus with equal vigor on implementing the SDGs, the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. So next month, we're going to meet again on the, for the 2030 conference of the parties of the UNFCCC, or COP28 in the UAE, to pave the way for the future for climate agenda, including for migrants, regardless of their migration status, and for people on the move. So we emphasize the need to build on the breakthrough achieved in the previous COP27, where for the first time, the direct link between climate change and displacement was highlighted in the decision Sharm El Sheikh Implementation Plan. And we continue to acknowledge that efforts to mitigate and adapt to the adverse effects of climate change have been insufficient, <laughs> including in climate finance and in adequately addressing loss and damage. So we call on the international community to have the political will to continue to address these gaps. So this IDM session, uh, to, to complete, uh, reminds us to think about tomorrow and act today. So how we address climate change today could contribute to and shape the extent 
uh, today and tomorrow, could contribute to and shape the extent of movement and displacement, including forced displacement, displace, forced displacement of people in the future. Uh, the GCM champion countries in their regional diversity under the leadership of Coaches El Salvador, y agradecemos, y agradecemos mucho El Salvador, and Morocco, are committed to continuing their leading role and lending their voices in ensuring that in the face of climate change, we will do our utmost to preserve and protect their rights, welfare, and security of migrants and people in the move. So we call on other member states to join us in the shared commitment. Pardon that it was a long intervention, but I speak for 30, minutes. 33 is, countries. This is, this is a London two minutes. This is yes. what I'm hearing. Thank you. Because, Thank you so much. I love you. Mr. Eduardo Jose de Vega, the Under Secretary for the Migrant Workers Affairs Department of the Foreign Affairs from the Republic of the Philippines. I thank you for your intervention there. Uh, I, I, I wonder now if our colleagues from, uh, the, from Hungary are yet present. If not, I shall move on uh, and we can have it later on. Alas. So I'd like now to uh, perhaps draw your attention to the first of our panels moderated uh, by, by my colleague. Uh, we can no longer talk about climate change without talking about human mobility. So we have said repeatedly uh, so far this morning. It's now indisputed that the adverse effects of climate change are increasingly forcing people to move from their homes. Our final uh, first panel will be moderated by His Excellency President Carlos Alvarado. They are the special envoy of the Global Center for Climate Mobility and the 48th President of the Republic of Costa Rica. Now, former President Carlos is a professor, a politician, an author, an expert in communication, so he'll do a better job than I will. Uh, he's a public policy and public-private partnership, uh, uh, works in that, in that area, and he has five years of experience in political communications and parliamentary advisory. He has sought communica taught communication at the School of Social Science at the University of Costa Rica and the Latina University of Costa Rica. He also served as an advisor to the Citizen Action Parties Group in the Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica from 2006 to 2010. So I now invite His Excellency, along with the members of his panel, so his panelists, to facilitate a dialogue on the main challenges, lessons learned, and the opportunities to scale up action on climate change and human mobility. They have 90 minutes to do so. Please take the stage. Thank you, moderator, and thank you all for being here. I believe the members of the panel are getting equipped and geared for this, for this panel. So just to give a little introduction before they join me here. As moderator said, my name is Carlos Alvarado, former president of Costa Rica, current professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, and uh, part of the board of the UN uh, Global Center for Climate Mobility. I want to harness as well the words of uh, General uh, of Director Amy Pope that this is a dialogue, and as that we should benefit from it in the exchange that we're going to to have, as we just have with her and with the other panelists and with the artist Julia because we all learn from that now that we can sing along jointly. So in the benefit of time, I will also be introducing the panelists and hopefully they'll be joining me while I'm introducing them. And I'll go with the order that I believe they've been geared. So, so we'll be having a discussion with 
Ida C. Hasler Jacob. She is the major of the commune of Santiago, Chile. She's a Chilean politician and economist who currently serves as the mayor of the commune of Santiago since 2021. Through her leadership, the city of Santiago has shown strong commitment to strengthening its migration government's structures. Prior to her appointment as mayor, Ms. Irasi was appointed president of the Gender Commission and vice president of the Education Commission in the Santiago City Council. Prior to that, she was head of the movement Avancemos, also in Chile. May we uh, welcome her with uh, a round of applause. <laughs> Mayor, please, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hola. <laughs> Gusto saludarlo. Por acá. Oh, Hi, please meeting you. Gusto saludarlo. Placer. <laughs> My pleasure. And also the order in which they have been equipped, we give the warm welcome to Mr. Eric White, who is the head of climate adaptation of the World Economic Forum. Please a round of applause for him. Hello. Mr. White is the head of climate adaptation at the World Economic Forum. Prior to this position, he served as head of the Forum IT Industry Vertical Facilitation Peer Communities four executives of the world's largest technology firms, helping them to tackle common challenges. And has an expertise in this world of high-level stakeholder liaison and relation to addressing world's most pressing issues. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Nice to be here. Great having you. Oh, there is my friend Bob. <laughs> so while he's getting also equipped, we have, uh, we're delighted to have Bob Natifu. Bob Natifu is the Deputy Climate Change Commissioner of the Government of Uganda and focal point for the African Kampala Ministerial Declaration on Migration, Environment and Climate Change. Bob has been instrumental in shaping Uganda's national climate policy uh, policies, such yeah. as the 2015 National Climate Change Policy, the National Determined Contributions, the National Communications, and the Biannual Update Reports. Welcome, Bob, to the panel. Thank you. Great having you. Do we have our... And finally, we have Mr. Rajan Kishore Panda. He is part of the steering group member, Climate Migration and Displacement Platform, and convener of Water Initiatives. We give him also a warm welcome, please. He has more than three decades of experience on climate change, disaster migration, displacement, water sanitation, river basin management, agriculture, livelihoods, food and nutrition, and nutrition security work in several fields also with uh, grassroots. He is a freelance researcher, writer, policy analyst, and consultant. And as you can see now, we have a very diverse uh, panel, both in backgrounds, in regions, and in their expertise. So the aim of this dialogue is actually to uh, set some guidelines to uh, what's coming um, in the next weeks, months, in the intersection of the discussion of climate change and human mobility. So uh, the purpose of this dialogue is not only to talk and share experience, but to influence action. And that's what we want to, to do at this moment, and then also by opening the floor to, to, to you. So, we're going to handle it in this, in this way. We're going to do it through three sections before opening to question and other remarks. First section, I'll be asking our panelists to share with us from their experiences what have been the concrete, if you have to mention the most concrete challenges that you currently suffer, which are those? To identify challenges from your perspective, but through the, to draw commonalities between them. 
Second part, we're going to go through them again, but seeking which solutions have worked. What do you have identified as learnings of things that work and also valuable things that doesn't learn, but we learn from that. First part, challenges. Second part, solutions. And I also encourage to feed your own interventions with what you have learned and he listened from other panelists, active learning as well. And in the third part, what we'll be looking at is if we were to encourage action, now what will that be for you? What is it required in terms of action? Looking into what IOM is doing, but also looking into other forums like the next COP. What, is, what needs to be true to accelerate both the diplomacy and the actions that we need in terms to address both climate change and human mobility? Do you agree? <laughs> I think you don't have more chance than to agree. <laughs> Uh, so let's 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 start, and I will I will start as we um, um, in, started by introducing Madam Mayor. Uh, please share with us if you were to say what's the main challenge you have faced at, a, at the head of uh, of your city and of your community. What would that be in terms of climate change and human mobility? Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning to the panelists also. My pleasure. And greetings to all participants in this IDM. In terms of mobility, migration, and also how to confront the climate crisis. I would like to explain where I come from. I come from Santiago, Chile's capital. I'm the mayor of the city, and I'm working in transformation hand in hand with rights in an intercultural city that changed a lot in the last 20 years. Our city, according to the last available data, has 43% of population is migrant. And on top of that, there's an increase in population in the last 20 years. We doubled our population. And of course, we have migrant communities from several countries as we were mentioning in the opening remarks. In our case, we see migration south-south from Venezuela, Colombia, Haiti, Bolivia, and Peru. And this is a challenge for us in terms of the, of the vulnerability of those people that get to our city. And that's why, answering to your question, in terms of challenges, we see the need First of all, to approach this population from a right-based perspective and to create possibilities for them. It's almost 44% of migrants. These are official data, but however, you probably know that part of migrants do it via non-legal pathways, and these people are not in the official data. So this is our first challenge. Also, in terms of what UN says, we need an order, safe and regulate migrants. Migration, and this is a challenge for our country. Specifically speaking about population that gets to our country, there's an important number, which are minors, children, boys and girls that get to public schools in our city. And this is also a challenge in terms of cohesion and multiculturality and also for the development they need in order to settle in our society. Boys and girls have less problems or less prejudice than adults, but discrimination because of the lack of access to different social rights is present in our city. And that's why an important thing is to give them the opportunity to go to public school and also to medical services. Because when we have a problem of a lack of rights, xenophobia and discrimination, 
migration starts, and this is something we have to work together. Our city is a live city, migration is there, and we, we, uh, we don't have climate change as one of our main challenges. Our main challenges are economy, employment, and also family reunification. However, in our country, we have migration coming from climate disasters. And that's why we see this need to work together in cooperation from UN system, but also among cities and countries, putting in the center the possibility of rights, human rights. Today, it's a challenge for us, for our city. We have a very active city, but we need, of course, to work public education, public health system in order to give rights to everybody to have social inclusion. As we have in this Gracias, migration alcaldesa. scenario. Yeah, I take Thank you some very much. Challenges. The scale of the challenge, more than 40% of that population, uh, the difference of origin, but this also mixed with local population that's migrating, in this case, due to uh, climate change. So, so that can also be one of those challenges you're facing. And I also want to, to stress what you mentioned of the necessity of orderly, secure, and registered migrations while doing so and facing challenges such as xenophobia, which I believe is one of the big topics that we are facing. Uh, I'll go then to, uh, to, to Eric. Eric, from, from the worst WEF's perspective, and it appears that we're moving from the major's reality in Chile, local reality of a country and a city receiving migration, to the WEF, where you see the, where is the intersection between those realities and challenges in communities that could be either Chile, but can be also, as we saw, in communities of the West Horn in Africa or in the Pacific Islands or elsewhere? How you relate that to the work in, and the challenges you see in your work in the World Economic Forum? Sure, thanks for the question and, and thank you for having me here. Um, I think before I start, I want to just sort of take a moment to talk a bit about my organization that a lot of people have, have heard of, um, but maybe you're wondering why I'm here. <laughs> um, so the World Economic Forum, if, if people know it, uh, they know it as a organization of private sector companies. Uh, and that's only partially true. We do have uh, more than 800 uh, private sector partners from 20 industries in every region around the world. But this is in service of a broader goal. The forum is the International Institution for Public-Private Collaboration. Uh, our sort of reason for being in the world is to take a what we call multi-stakeholder approach to what we feel are really complex systemic problems. And by multi-stakeholder, we mean business, government, civil society, academia, international organizations, youth, and other stakeholders of that category. Uh, and we're here because we're starting to look at climate migration as one of these hard global systemic problems that requires a multi-stakeholder approach to address. So we're coming at this from the 10,000 meter level uh, at the moment. Uh, as opposed to the, the ground level like the, the mayor is talking about. Um, so from that perspective, let me offer some thoughts, um, sort of some things as we see them and where we are on our journey with this issue. And I will say it's a journey. Um, and one of my roles at the forum as head of climate adaptation is to think about our strategy in this space. So I do want to flag that I'm here to learn as much as I am to share uh, our experience and perspective. So question, sort of answer one, I actually haven't heard this this morning, but I think it needs to be said, is that climate migration is first and foremost a result of climate change, and what we need to be doing to um, tackle climate change is reducing greenhouse gas emissions massively. So we cannot forget that mitigation first and foremost is the need, it needs to be said, we can't forget it. 
So beyond that, I would say three things, uh, challenges that we see. One is adaptation. Um, I think many of you will have read the, the UNEP adaptation, adaptation gap report and seen the sort of eye-catching statistic that financing is five to 10x less than what's required. Um, that's something that we're looking at and we think needs to have a lot more importance over the next few years. Second thing is a bit what the mayor talked about, uh, labor market integration in receiving countries, in particular receiving countries with high rates of unemployment already. Um, and then sort of the final one I wanna mention uh, is the, I would say the securitization of the problem. Uh, and what I mean by that is you know, a state's reaction to, to climate migration can be driven by a national security apparatus that's trained to see threats as actors. And in the case of climate migration, the threat is clearly climate change or nature degradation or ecosystem destruction. Um, but because those are actor-less, a symptom of the challenge, which is the migration, uh, becomes seen as the threat itself because the national security apparatus likes to, to deal with actors. Um, so I think having the, having the security establishment, and by the security establishment, I don't mean NATO country security establishment. I mean in every country around the world, start to reconceive of how they deal with threats emerging from the natural environment. That's a challenge, maybe getting into the opportunities piece. Um, and I will say that sort of con conclude by tying back to my, my first piece, which is this may not be something you expect to hear from the World Economic Forum. Uh, but this is something that we're looking at. Uh, and one of my roles is to, to work with an expert council inside of the forum on how we understand the evolving relationship between nature degradation and understandings of security. So um, I'll stop there for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I. I... I welcome your remarks when you say also being here to learn, which I believe it's, it's, a, it's great to, to open that perspective, but I think also, as you said, to contribute and collaborate in that. And you have done that with, with your remarks, bringing the topic in terms of how the security narratives have a, an effect on the narratives of migration, which I believe is one of the topics, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's present and also in the terms of adaptation and how uh, we need to link the discussions on adaptation with human mobility. And it was mentioned before uh, in, the, in the previous discussion. So I'll turn now to, uh, to Bob Natifu. And uh, Bob, tell us a little bit about also your work, uh, in its, its connection with the Kampala Declaration, but also what you uh, are doing in climate change in your country, in Uganda, and your work. Tell us a little bit of what you're doing and what challenges are you facing and what intersections you see with what uh, Madam Mayor has expressed before and also what uh, Eric had mentioned from the World Economic Forum. Bob, please. Thanks very much, Your Excellency. And I'll, I'll start by making two general points outside the specific answers that I'm going to give to your question. First is, I was inspired by the remarks of all the, um, all the um, speakers that have come before me, but particularly the keynote speakers, uh, where the Director General, Amy Pope, talked about the IDM platform providing us an opportunity to hear from people you rarely hear from, and I'm, I'm proud, proud to be one, one of those. The, the second point is, I arrived in Geneva, Geneva Last, last night, night around, around past midnight, midnight. <coughs> uh, I, was uh, I was in Berlin. Berlin. And why was, and why I, was Berlin? I in Berlin? I was in Berlin, was in Berlin, Berlin talking about almost the, almost same, the same topic, explaining, explaining the Kampala Ministerial, Ministerial Declaration and what we are doing at regional, at regional and, and continental level, level. Uh, but also, uh, our, but also aspirations our aspirations in terms of taking this forward with the support of IOM. So, so this also links to what, to what again, again the, the DG and the previous keynote speakers have talked what about. What does that tell us? It actually us tells us that um, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's an incredible amount of uh, uh, effort, uh, effort and interest going into this discussion, into this discussion of climate change, environment, environment uh, and migration, uh, and, migration. And, by and by extension, 
human mobility human mobility so the key point here so is the that key we point here is that um, we can't um, we can't begin we can't continue thinking about um, tomorrow necessarily without necessarily uh, having the urge, uh, having the urge to act for me that's a central thesis into which uh, all these discussions are happening and i think it gives some kind of steer the, um, the into the um, the direction that we are going so into straight so straight to the response so straight to the response of your question what we are doing in terms of um, the challenges we are faced with promoting this regional uh, Approach and, uh, approach and collaboration i'll speak to three important I'll aspects, speak to three important which, aspects I which i look at from how, from where we're coming from from july 2022 in coming up with this kampala declaration from the regional level and then expanding it further to continental, further to continental level where you've had 32 nations have signed up today three points one there's three points one around, there's an issue around um, policy coherence um, in policy terms coherence. of how do these policies, in terms of play, how do these policies right play about national, right from the, the national again, again that from the subnational level that the mayor is talking to about to national then to regional and then you take it to to global to global the second point the is, second point um, is um, about about additionality that the value, that the value addition, addition that the policies or any, or any frameworks, that, frameworks you're that you're trying to come up with, with how, they how they contribute generally to for example the the the, 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 the global targets, the global that, targets that have been set in the uh the climate change convention or the paris agreement or anything or that, anything that we discussed about uh, sustainable, uh, development sustainable development in general and the third one and the third one is bound around uh issues to do with issues to do with compatibility compatibility then how again then all how three again all these about, three play about what in terms of what kind of development agenda do you want to put forward to achieve these three but to achieve these three challenges uh, we have to talk about uh, we have to talk about multi stakeholder approaches and the multi stakeholder approaches or collaboration from, from is about from where i come from is about rethinking the traditional views and rethinking the traditional views and creating territorial governance the real territorial governance territorial governance through the partnerships between uh, like governments it's been uh, like it's african been demonstrated at the african continent working with a regional, working or, with a regional level, but or maybe sub national level but also bringing into the space the uh, un agencies iom undp and uh, everybody else to even civil society including and, civil society um, and um, uh, private sector uh, private it's sector it's about finding the right it's about finding the right uh, partnership we often hear about uh, the whole, whole of government approach uh, or the whole of society, uh, or the whole of society approach, approach. And, this means and this means bringing together different ministries, different, ministries, um, um, different, authorities, different authorities with a focus on climate change with a focus on environment with a focus on disaster management urban governance policing and that's combined with the kind of effort, kind of effort that is going in country to deal with the IDPs, to deal with the refugees and so on and so forth. So to me, so to me approach that this approach that we are taking about the for Kampala the Ministerial Kampala Ministerial Declaration, Declaration is a kind of a multi-sectoral approach, uh, which is, uh, which, central is thesis, which central thesis is actually, is actually based on collaboration and partnership and strengthening and ensuring that each one plays a part to advance the priorities that have been enlisted by the different member states. And in a uh, sense, this expanded, uh, declaration, this expanded declaration actually recognizes this very big challenge in, those in terms of addressing about, those three key points I've talked about, policy, coherence, coherence and additionality, uh, and compatibility. Uh, compatibility. And again, it emphasizes, and the, importance again, it emphasizes the importance of cooperation to comprehensively tackle the challenges and opportunities that, challenges exist, and opportunities that exist between the climate change and migration, which nexus, which nexus which uh, has for a very long time, uh, for a very long about, time but been talked really about, about but so not really thought about so much fully to have to these kind of frameworks that are going to guide the, really the action that the country is really much like to advance uh, uh, this uh, action and promote and individual and livelihood and well-being in our own spaces and beyond. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Rob. And before Thank you, Bob. And before turning it also to Rajan, please, Madam Moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear esteemed panelists and President Carlos, please, allow me just a moment of your time to interrupt with, with an intervention from our colleagues, from our colleagues in Hungary. In Hungary. Uh, if, you uh, if you are there, please turn on your mic, turn on and, your make mic and make your two-minute contribution. contribution. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, dear Mr. Well, thank President. You so much, dear Mr. President. It's great seeing you again. Uh, thank you for the last time uh, reception uh, in, uh, Costa in uh, Costa Rica. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm, I really do appreciate the Director General Amy Pope for giving me this chance to address you. To address you, actually, she told me six minutes, so I rather would like to stick to what the Director General said. If you, if you don't mind, the reason why I asked for the floor from her and why she allowed me to speak here today during this panel is that I'm coming from a country which uh, has now been under a very uh, severe uh, pressure of uh, migration since we are uh, at the border of the most active migratory route currently to uh, Europe, which is leading uh, through the Western Balkans, and we have been faced with one of the biggest uh, pressures ever of migration uh, we have experienced. Last year, we have stopped 275,000 illegal migrants at our border. This year, we are at 155,000. But, Mr. President, President and dear colleagues, what I'd like to tell you is that we are now faced with a totally new dimension of challenge, of challenge which is a huge, huge and, unprecedented and unprecedented aggression as uh, the migrants, as, uh, the migrants and, the and especially the smugglers are being equipped by weapons. weapons. And they are not only shooting, at, not each only other, shooting at each other, the smugglers are not, the smugglers only, fighting are not only fighting with each other, but they started to use they started automatic, to use weapons, automatic and, uh, weapons and, uh, and they are shooting at the Hungarian border guard, which totally us in a totally new and situation. Mr. President, I do believe and Mr. President, that we should, make it, clear that we should finally, make it clear finally that such kind of a uh, phenomenon, and phenomenon and behavior, and behavior and is unacceptable and that not be must tolerated. not be tolerated. A violation of border, a violation of uh, border must be considered, uh, as, a crime uh, must be considered as a crime and an attack against sovereignty of a country and that should be appropriately should be appropriately handled. Who are and we all, who are bearing responsibility of governing uh, we the country, are all, uh, uh, we are all uh, responsible for the security of our homelands and, and of our citizens, and that's what we do have to, that's what uh, we do uh, have to uh, guarantee. Uh, guarantee. Therefore, Mr. President and Madam Moderator, we do count on, do count on, on the uh, international uh, organization of migration to provide a platform, a platform for rational kind of dialogue. Unlike the dialogue, unlike the dialogue in Brussels, their migration is being inspired. Model are of the being, smugglers uh, are being uh, and supported, EU and EU is operating basically as a operating as a magnet so for migration. Of so instead of inspiration, we do have to tackle we finally. The, uh, the root causes, uh, which have been root mentioned, causes, by, which have been mentioned uh, by the panelists so uh, as well. Challenges, so economic challenges, wars and armed conflicts, wars and armed conflicts the uh, struggle, the, uh, and, um, struggle and, challenges and, um, and challenges regarding the food supply and water supply and, and water climate change as well. Change as well. Where, there's war, where there's a war, Mr. President, there we have to, make, president, peace. We have to make peace. Where there's an economic, where there's an crisis, economic we crisis, we have to carry out development, have to carry out development where there are progress. Where there are challenges regarding food and water supply, we do have to ensure the deliveries and access. And when it comes to climate very high on the agenda this is very high on the agenda of Director General Pope. Pope. We there we will be absolutely there supported. Will be absolutely we supported. We, we, supported. Have we do have to strengthen the global cooperation, cooperation in order to fight and climate change. change. And in this regard, Hungary takes its fair share or even given beyond the fact that given the fact that we do not consider uh, environmental, environmental protection as a political as issue, as issue but as an issue to preserve our planet for our, planet for our successors. Therefore, Therefore, we are proud to be among those 20 countries, those 20 countries in the world where GDP is being, where GDP is being increased to decrease parallelly to decreasing in emission. emission. And with our nuclear and solar, nuclear and solar we investments, will to, uh, we will be able to uh, produce our electricity 90% carbon neutral by 2030. And last but not least, my last remark, Mr. President, we Hungarians are, are ready and absolutely at the disposal, and absolutely at the disposal of the international community, of the international to, support community the to support countries the developing in countries efforts in their efforts in the and struggle of tied aid in the framework of tied aid credits, given to the scholarships given the to the students, development the official development assistance in order programs in order to provide you a technological, you a technological development with which, with which in economies the in the developing countries can be modernized that in a way can that lowered, emission can be lowered, and then an important root cause of migration, cause of migration uh, can, be uh, can be tackled. IOM can, can definitely count on Hungary, definitely a, count on Hungary a, which, is country, an which is an emergency situation because, currently of, a because of a tremendous pressure of migration. Of migration. So I'd like to, so ask, all like to ask all of you to cooperate on tackling the root causes and preventing further migratory flaws to be started because that would put such a 
danger and such a challenge uh, in Europe many countries uh, in Europe and in the world that would be very, very complicated to tackle. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Hungary. Thank, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your comments uh, and contributions. I just want now, to make one point. I just want to make one dialogue. point. Dialogue. The clue is in the title. The clue is in dialogue, the title. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. dialogue, dialogue. We must listen to all sides. Favor no opinion. Favor no opinion. But listen to common sense. But listen to common what sense presents. and what the data presents. President Carlos, over to, President you, Carlos, over to you and back to your panel. Thank you, Malder. Thank you, Malder. Thank you to, the, minister, thank you to the minister for his uh, remarks. Um, going on then to the uh, dialogue, we were to, uh, we were to, uh, to listen from you uh, the challenges uh, that you face in, uh, in the ground, in, the ground, in different and various fields you work from, from grassroots organizations to water to disaster. Um, what are those challenges, um, what are those challenges uh, that you have faced? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. First of all for having thank me you, first of all, for having me here. It's been a long and it has Hectic been a journey. long and hectic I journey. Arrived, I, I just arrived, I think, 15 <laughs> minutes before the panel. Please so welcome. Please, <laughs> welcome. Please, <laughs> please bear with <laughs> my fatigue, <laughs> if, if any. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, when, it I think uh, when it comes to challenges, uh, I, I, would uh, I, I would definitely like, like to say that, you know, the regions where we, uh, work, regions like where we Bengal, work, like the Bay of Bengal, uh, either in India or Bangladesh, uh, in India like, or Bangladesh like, India, like we work in India, but many of our partners in the CMDB network, they work in other regions as well. Uh, one thing that uh, we should try to understand in a way before, before coming to uh, the questions is that economy is, is, that not, economy a is not a flat thing, thing as, as the society. As, as the society. So I think the very foundational understanding of economy is very different for different people. And in many parts of the Bay, and for, in many example, parts of the Bay uh, for example, and the challenges, uh, that's why, and, and the challenges kind of that's why a different kind of challenges is happen. That the local is that are not the local economies are gross not domestic product, gross domestic product linked economies. You know, linked economies. They are rather mostly the gross, they are rather mostly nature, the gross product linked economies. nature product linked economies. And that is where the intersection, and that is where the intersection happens between, happens change between and, climate change and and environmental degradation. And many of the migration and many of the migration and even displacement. Actually, they are basically actually they are basically uh, forced, uh, forced by situations, by situations of environmental of degradation. degradation. Or I would say common or I would say common property resources degradation, including the right to the resources. By the people. By the people, uh, you know, and and uh, that's you know, and, and that's the region. A lot of migration they keep on happening. Migration is not for a new like India, for, for a country example, like India, places. for example, or many places. And that's also and where, that's also the, next where the next challenge comes. Is there is a tendency of, is normalizing, is a tendency the of normalizing the pattern because of migration. Uh, because it's not new, it has been, uh, happening. It's not new. It has been happening, people migrate, it is aspirational, intergenerational, intergenerational in changes in perception is happening, in so far a job is concerned, so there is always so a section of, of people who is moving. But then the challenge, but then the challenge is, is, there is a new section, there is a new of, people section of people or many new sections of people, because as I said, society is also not a flat thing, it's not a linear you know, uh, uh, domain, uh, to be uh, domain to be explained. It's like a very complex. It's like a very complex. It's a very diverse. It's a very diverse kind of a. Uh, you know, kind of a kind of a milieu. So that is the reason. So that is the reason. The challenge I think, the challenge from, I the think the from the grassroots to the policy level is consider or many, we consider or many many, times consider or many, many consider times policymakers consider that the solutions that we are offering to people have to be the same have to be the same. So it's somewhere we decide, so it's somewhere we decide kind of that a particular kind of economic model is going to work and that is how the people will respond to a particular stimulus in a particular way. I think that is exactly where the problem lies at a foundational level. Many people like, for example, many indigenous communities, their culture, their culture, their cultural roots, their very basic identity, are, very basic are, linked identity are linked to the local natural, the local resources, natural the resources, the commons. And degradation, and of, degradation, that degradation of that is impacting, is impacting, impacting, them, impacting in them in many ways. And it is also and not it very, is also true, not in very true in many senses that people actually want to as move. An as an adaptation. Many a times people many don't a times want to people move. Don't want and that's the region you see a lot of 
that protests happen in that many happen of in the many, many of projects. the development like projects, when there is a dam like when there is a dam being constructed, or there is, mining, or there is uh, new mining uh, coming off, or there is even a new kind of a you know cities being built expanded. Many local people they protest. Many local people they protest. They don't want to go away from so their calling place. That every so calling that every migration is actually uh, you know, a positive, uh, you know, adaptation strategies is not true in many senses because people are rooted to certain areas. Their skills are rooted to certain areas. Their cultural ethos and values are rooted to certain areas. Migration so happens. when migration like happens, migration, like the new migration the new of or the new form of displacement uh, by climate change, uh, and, disasters, climate change and disasters, so people are also at a, at a, at a, very, at a very, very crucial crossroad. Many people, they don't want to Many move, people, they don't but, want they to move to but they are because forced to move the because the land doesn't the have the kind of resources to sustain them anymore. Them anymore. So, they have to move. so they have to move. And at the same time, the governments are in a fix because there is no place to them. shift them there are many many there are many many local are governments are facing, facing this challenge that where to shift, that them, where to because shift them because conventional the conventional migration routes inside, inside a country like for india, example like india would not be you know, accommodating, be, you know all accommodating all the people who want to migrate and if, even if they and migrate, if, even if they migrate, where are they going to stay? Where are they going, going, to, stay? To, where, where are they going to be accommodated? They are going to create. They are going to create of a, another you know, kind of a you know world in the cities, like in dinkies, in, like in, uh, dinkies, informal, in, settlements. in uh, informal settlements, in new kind of challenges. So, kind of many, challenges. Migration so many migration are. Internal. Many a displacement are actually, internal. Displacement are actually and internal. That is, that is what we and that is facing. that is what we have and been facing. Many of them and are actually many of them are actually involuntary. These are some of the challenges. So these are some of the that challenges you, you that face you, you face at a foundational level. I think the second kind of I think the second kind of challenge is the policy is not making is adopted. not. As you know, adapt, as adaptive, as, you know, climate, as adaptive to the climate change, uh, climate change as scenarios. It as it so should for be. Example, so, for example, uh, we have policies, uh, we have policies to, rehabilitate to rehabilitate people who are displaced by, are a, displaced dam by a dam or project, a project or a mining or a project, project or a road project. But we don't, but know, we don't how know how to compensate, compensate people, people who are actually, who are actually mig migrating, due, migrating due to climate change or due to sea level rise or due or, or because or, their or lands, are, lands are, are being engulfed by the sea. By the sea. So, who is so the culprit? Is something if that is not defined? I think government. I think governments are in a fix to take policy decisions, take policy decisions. and and nobody is and, going, to, and take nobody is going to take the responsibility. Polluter, the polluters pay, pay, pay principles are actually not working at the so moment. I think so I think this is where I would say that a lot of challenges that are linked from the micro to the macro level, and that is where we need to do well. You know, a lot of synergy. Sort of synergy, bring in a lot of synergy and and working together. I think these are some of the one final issues. Aspect one final aspect we because work nature as well. we work with we nature as well. We feel that talent. a lot of talent. You know, you know, because at the moment the whole, you know, you know, world, is the moment the whole world is looking for so solution in nature. Beyond, so you just you know, go from this beyond, you know, from this migration the dialogue, the dialogue to the NBS dialogue, NBS dialogue for example, nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based so solutions. Around the world so everybody around the world is thinking that nature is going to sustain us, us kind of you know, against the kind of climate vagaries that we are facing. But most of these people who are migrating or being forced to migrate or forced to displace are actually also people who have a rich repository of knowledge of nature conservation. That we are so something that we are haunted each day is many of these people who are actually coming from these natural resources, rich and you know, traditional knowledge systems. When when they are migrating out to cities and staying in some dinkies, some informal settlements over a period of time, that knowledge of conservation is also you know, getting so we lost. Are also losing a kind of so we are also, also losing a kind of. That's also another intergenerational, you know, intergenerational shift that is happening, and that is not, that is not, that is not a, good uh, a good indicator of a sustainable so development. I, I would, so I, I would, says, uh, at the moment, would say, uh, you know, this thank much. You, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll go to move then to solutions, and I encourage you to.
share those pieces, share those pieces of knowledge from your experience of what you, of what you see that works, that works and also, and also what, what doesn't in the, in the, in the, in the fields you, you, you've been, been involved. involved. So, so I'll, I'll start with you, with you uh, Bob. What, what do you believe are those solutions you've seen that have been implemented that, that work, work in which, which doesn't, doesn't that, you that you can share with the, with the, with, with, with the, the people, people in this forum that, that might be a good, good, a good uh, example, example to, to, to learn from? from. Okay, okay, so, so thanks, thanks very much, Excellency. Excellency. Um, I think, again, again I'll, I'll, I'll lend my uh, thoughts so much on to what we're doing with the Kampala Ministerial Declaration in terms of what has worked, but then I also go into the exact specifics of what countries have spoken about and through my own experience of what has really made us form uh, ideas around this Ministerial Declaration. Um, the first three general points about, first in terms of the declaration is that um, signing up to this by all the uh, 32 member states, I think, is a, is a, is a bold step already and it's um, uh, something that we think is going to work. Um, the second point is we all know for sure that human mobility is an adaptation option for many. You've heard from uh, uh, Panda here uh, talking about people moving, although he says uh, they, they, they may not mind so much where they're going, but I know for, for sure they'll never mind where they're going because I know wherever they go, they'll find shelter, and that's why we end up with um, the slum areas. So, but you see they're running away from places which uh, have become completely um, unproductive for them, and wherever else they choose to go is definitely will become their next uh, place of abode. So in terms of the specific actions that are working, I'll try to give two broad examples. Um, countries are making countless effort and trying to rethink about solutions both at national, subnational, and um, regional level. For example, in the Eastern Horn of Africa, we see there's recognition that sustainable use of um, degraded land to minimize forced rural urban movements um, is central in addressing human mobility because uh, from where we come from, you're purely agriculture based. If it rains, it rains hardest to the poor, and if it doesn't rain still, it rains, it does, it, again, the, the impact of that is extreme. And by extension, uh, that land will become uh, unproductive for quite a while, and the population will see no sense in staying into that kind of uh, land to continue uh, meeting their individual livelihood and well-being. So you can see that recognition that once this has failed, I'll need to move. So countries have recognized that. The second point is um, that community-based um, asset creation programs for people moving into cities due to climate impacts. Um, you can clearly see the voices coming through while framing this uh, declaration that look wireless recognize uh, human mobility happens, migration happens, but I think there has to be a, a bit of effort uh, to ensure that these people continue having a decent life. And maybe one of the ways in which countries are looking at offering in part a bit of a decent life is community-based asset creation programs that will help uh, uh, me to achieve good health, education, and so on and so forth. Uh, the final one, if you look at, for example, uh, an, an example from Somalia that we, we've had in the discussions leading up to this KDMEC from Somalia across the Sahel, the example of microinsurance schemes for drought-affected pastoralists. So this, in my view, I think is uh, some of the key ideas coming through from the community, and I think some of them are being implemented except at small scale. And I think now the discussion needs to be how then do we increase this at scale? And that discussion can happen in any forum, whether here or at COP or anything, but I think there is already uh, having this Kampala Ministerial Declaration as a framework that is, uh, that, that actually in a very smart way recognizes all this through the commitments that have been enlisted, but also forward looking in terms of what it is that we need to do, but also calling for action is something that we really uh, um, consciously optimistic that it's going to uh, help address and continue to help us thinking about tomorrow and act today. Thank you. Thank you, Robin.
that for the how to implement this at scale. I think that's it's going to let's put that on the parking lot because that's a valuable thought in terms of in terms of uh, the next part of the conversation, which is the action we need. But let's turn then to let's go back to to Chile in this case, um, Senor Alcaldesa, um, on the solutions. Which are the solutions you have found in your exercise? Las soluciones en el caso del, del ejemplo de la alcaldía en, en Chile. In the case of Chile. Thank you very much. You have the floor, ma'am. First of all, I would like to thank the speakers. I believe we all have a lot to learn one from another. We need to share our own experiences. And more importantly, we need to understand that globally, we need to focus on local perspectives that can be replicated globally, both in order to tackle migration and climate change related challenges. I'd like to share a few best practices that we have promoted in Santiago de Chile, our capital city. And I would like to raise a few points here. First, information is key. Of course, it might sound obvious, but it's clear that in order to promote transformative public policies, sound information, evidence-based information is key. Secondly, we need to build alliances, as my colleague also mentioned, alliances are key with the UN system, with academia, and alliances with local communities. What in Santiago we call co-management. So of course the municipality, the city council plays an important role, so does the state, but the participation of grassroots organizations from neighborhoods, the 26 neighborhoods of Santiago matters. And alliances shall also promote cooperation. This will be a key. Of course, in order to tackle complex challenges, we will have to discuss about complex realities, about how to fund resource, fine resources, sorry, et cetera. And we also need to promote financial independence and decent work. This will mark a difference when it comes to tackling the relationships with migrant communities and their integration and engagement in Chile. In this sense, I would like to, say, to share with you a few examples. First, in terms of information, I would like to thank the IOM because we are the first community in our country that has been able to set up migration governance indicators at the local level. And this has been very important in our context in order to share information about our community, the public policies in favor of migrants and also all the challenges ahead. Being the first piece of work that we have promoted in our country, well, today it's been made available for all municipalities and we hope that this lighthouse at the capital city is will be seen all around the communities in our country in Chile. Now, let me focus on alliances. We have built a very strong with the UN system, which has included the ILO, the UNHCR, and other UN agencies. They have been of great support in order to respond to key challenges in the area of migration. In this sense, I would like to underline the importance of replicating best practices globally. The MPTF, the Multi Partner Trust Fund, has been of great support. We have implemented it in Mexico City and in Santiago de Chile. We have done it to cities in parallel, and it's been very enriching as a process. Partnering with Mexico and Chile in partnership with the UN system has been very interesting. We have placed at the center the promotion of this work, and in the framework of this MPTF, we have been able to develop a safe pathway for migrants with a clear orientation towards social integration, as well as different initiatives. One of the most well-known initiatives has been the one called Santiago Cooks, which aims at giving legal status to migrants in order for them to be able to find a decent job. So we want to support entrepreneur initiatives, which sometimes unfortunately happen in the informal environment and which also have an impact in the public space. So we want to promote the process towards legalizing migrant workers in order for them to find a decent job. In this case, this example uh, focused on cooking, which has been also key in terms of partnering with the UN system. Of course, we need to speak about training and empowerment because this has been also key. 
I would also like to mention the importance of promoting human rights for all, not only in the area of financial independence, which the ILO has been focusing on in our municipality. By the way, I would like to thank the ILO because this means that we are sharing global challenges. Our country, unfortunately, has a great number of informal workers, and as a result of this, many of our citizens migrate. And in the sense, promoting financial independence will be key. But not only for those who are in search of a job, but also their families. That's why in my previous intervention, I raised the importance of granting access to high quality health services and education, because this will be key in order to ensure human rights for all, basic human rights for all. Of course, this might sound simple, but for example, when to promote language uh, teaching, many of the migrants that arrived to Chile speak. Spanish, but some migrants from Haiti don't speak Spanish, so they are very much, uh, let's say, left behind, and they have this entails more difficult when it comes to having access to the health service or the education system, and this is a challenge that we are responding to by offering free Spanish classes. Not to speak about the importance of promoting and embracing multiculturality. Our basic schools, the schools of our community, have played a key role in promoting a multinational, multicultural society. And this has been a win-win situation because the schools declare to have improved as a result of celebrating international days and traditions from other parts of the world. It's also very important to reinforce public education, to boost the public education system, which unfortunately has been undermined in the last countries, in the last year, sorry, in our country. The arrival of migrant workers and migrant children have contributed to boosting our educational system. Last but not least, I would like to underline a lesson learned, which can be also considered a challenge, and this has to do with our legal framework. This, of course, is not the, the I mean, it does not depend on municipalities because we have no competences when it comes to border control. But, of course, all the steps forward in the legal framework are directly reflected in our city. Of course, the main migration route is in the north in Chile, but of course migrants come all the way down to Chile and many of the migrants when there is no legal framework or sound legal framework in order to promote legal and regular migration pathways, we have a direct impact in the in the capital city. I'm sure it's not only the case of Chile but also all around the world. Thank you very much. I, I take from your intervention uh, the importance of data and I think that's shared across the different regions. Alliances, also very key element. There's none one actor that could address the, the phenomena both of climate change and mobility on its own. Alliances are key. You mentioned how critical is um, the part of decent work and, uh, for, for the, the communities um, that are um, migrating and the intersection with uh, topics like health, education, and how, how, how it's regulated or ordenamiento uh, urbano, as you mentioned. I'll, I'll move to then to, to Eric. From the perspective of various stakeholders in, in, in the global agenda, w where do you see the possibilities for those solutions from your experience uh, in your work from WEF? Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, start a bit practically. Right. So we, we at the, the World Economic Forum have convened uh, something that we call the Refugee Employment Alliance, uh, which is co-chaired by UNHCR and by the Inca Group, which is the um, holding company that operates uh, IKEA stores. Um, they've put out uh, a number of principles on integrating refugees into local employment contexts and are working to develop cases and put these out uh, around the world. There are some very good examples. Uh, one of them is skills-first approaches to employment rather than language-first approaches. So there's a great example here in Switzerland with IKEA where they, they don't have a language-intensive interview process. They have sort of a five-day trial period and a language buddy system. I think this I may be preaching to the choir on some of this, um, but we see that working. Um, we have a, there's a principle on investing in job matching. So there's a program by ADECO, which is a, uh, an employment company in Switzerland uh, that has actually a Jobs for Ukraine portal that was set up uh, in the aftermath of the uh, invasion last year. 
And then we talk about creating partnerships that combine social and that combine both so social and employment support. And we have a number of examples there. So that's sort of a bit more practical, um, and sort of maybe more on topic. Uh, but I want to spend more time talking about adaptation in general, um, which is sort of partially because it's my role, but partially because I think it's the big sort of system level challenge that we face. And I mentioned in my earlier intervention that we like to think of things as um, how do we come at it from a multi-stakeholder perspective. And adaptation, in my view, has not been addressed in a multi-stakeholder way uh, to date. And in this particular case, I think the missing constituency is, is business. Uh, there's a, I think, a little bit old by now statistic that um, is from WRI that says that less than 1% of uh, funding for adaptation comes from the private sector. And it may be a little bit dated, but that sort of validates my own experience of talking with business about how they do this. And this comes from a really deep-seated misunderstanding within the business community of what the international community means when they say adaptation. It's not a word they understand. Um, it, comes from a misunderstanding of their own exposure and vulnerability to climate risk. You know, the, most businesses spend, I think, 10 times as much effort talking about risks from the transition to a green economy, so regulatory risks, that sort of thing, than they do about actual physical impacts on their supply chains and operations and et cetera from climate impacts. There are some exceptions. The, what I like to call the real climate exposed sectors like agriculture, like Nestle's on top of this, for example. Um, but beyond that, it's limited. Um, and one of the ways that businesses perceive adaptation is large infrastructure investments that are, have been traditionally difficult for governments uh, to open up to private sector participation. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think the sort of a real clear example I can think of is sort of drought resistant seed varieties. That's a long standing international development intervention that folks have been funding for, for ages and ages. And it's clearly an adaptation solution, and an adaptation solution that's most frequently provided by the public sector. Uh, there are lots of other such solutions out there that don't exist yet because the private sector hasn't started investing in the kinds of innovation tools, goods, services, the individuals and more so actually businesses in climate impacted, especially global south countries will need. So I think the real opportunity here is to think about how do we position companies in climate vulnerable global south countries to lead on development of a new adaptation economy create these goods and services, uh, generate revenue, create employment in places that are going to be impacted by climate change so as to A, avoid out-migration in the first place, and B, develop absorptive capacity for migrants that flow in. Um, and I just want to sort of close by sharing a story that I heard uh, it, two weeks ago in New York on this, which is about rainwater harvesting. Right. Rainwater harvesting, many of you will be familiar with, first developed in India, um, deployed extensively in Africa, supported by a lot of development finance, never thought of as a solution for the global north. You know, Scandinavian donors, CETA, NORAD, et cetera, put tons of money into it. And now there are companies that have developed commercializable rainwater harvesting technologies, many of them Israeli, so not global south, but sort of illustrates the principle, and are selling them to Swedish farmers. Right? So technology developed with CETA money for use in the global south being deployed by non-global north countries into global north markets because climate change represents a fundamental shift in sort of the, the economy of the world. I, I like to link in it, or to, I like to make the analogy to digital transformation. It's sort of an exogenous impact that's going to shift value pools. And countries that are at the forefront of that impact if they support innovation in the right way, can be leaders in this new adaptation economy. And that will change the whole dynamic of this conversation. Uh, so how can we support that? Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. Thank you, Eric. And I believe those you sh showcase many valuable uh, examples of solutions 
um, that are that are good for this for this dialogue. So I'll ask the, the panelists um, going to you first, Rajan, but then to the others to think about what is that call to action that you will pose as as the most critical. If you were to say that topic that is critical in the um, for action, what it, would it be? So I'll start with you, Rajan, and I'll also then go to the other panelists, also uh, requesting to be brief on those remarks because Madam Moderator is giving me the, the look already <laughs> on the time. So please, Rajan, what will be that call to action? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, before the Bonn Intercessional, uh, the CMDP and uh, FES, Frederici Bot Stiftung, we together, we organized some uh, regional consultations to understand the dynamics and uh, challenges of uh, migration displacement in, in context of climate change. And also we wanted to find out solutions. And surprisingly, something that we found is even between our network members, we have different good, uh, you know, positive examples. Like uh, Bangladesh has already implemented or at least brought in a policy for rehabilitation of internally displaced people. Fiji has got a positive, uh, uh, you know, policy. But then uh, countries like India are still struggling uh, to make, uh, take these kind of policy decisions. So I think the first thing that I would say is that, uh, you know, there are some initiatives already happening, is that, you know, uh, pulling together all these uh, policy measures that are already in place and finding out how a synergy can happen, how cross-country learning can happen, so that there is climate justice and as Siu was saying from the beginning, uh, most importantly, how to promote uh, this people first and nature first policies that really ensure climate justice for the people who are the most vulnerable, uh, uh, you know, due to climate change. The second thing I would say, as uh, uh, you know, I was trying to say from the beginning, the current capacity of data generation is very limited because, uh, you know, we have some good initiatives at the global level of generating data on migration and displacement. But then at the local level, we find that there's a lot of gap and uh, catching the diversity and, and the multi-layer challenges of migrant people is still a far away, uh, you know, phenomena. So I think there we can work together and there we could actually promote, uh, that's a call to action. A lot of data uh, generation is required. The third thing, what we are facing at in, in India, especially in the state of Odisha, where we're trying to work with the government to actually uh, develop a policy for uh, climate displaced migrant people, uh, is that, you know, the attribution studies are still very naive. They are very primary, at, at, at a very primary level. So, understanding the real challenges, because governments don't operate at the uh, national and provincial levels. They don't operate without, you know, set of indicators that are verifiable. That are actually without data that that can actually bring in policy decisions because they cannot take decisions they cannot allocate budgets like budget for example climate finance is a challenge that we that i think will, will be discussed in other uh, forum but then unless the data is generated unless the real threat is actually accessible at the micro scale it, it's very difficult for governments to take policy policy decisions so i think that is another thing we should work out and uh, the fourth, I always say, there cannot be a right to life for human beings without a right to a right of life to, of nature, of rivers. And most of these migrations that I see and the way we have been studying are actually interlinked with the degradation of nature, whether due to climate change or local factors. So I think that is another action that we should take. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric White your call to action in one, less than one minute, Ruby, by the look of the moderator. <laughs> Sorry. Sure, I, I'll be really brief. I mean, I'm, I'm here because I think we can scale some of the solutions that we're talking about. It, my pet project over the next year is gonna be 
how can we scale business investment in innovation goods and services that will help people adapt? So if there are any business leaders in the audience, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. Um, but some of these solutions are gonna need to be de-risked. So it's not purely a business effort, right? This is a multi-stakeholder approach. So if you're from a bilateral donor or another type kind of organization that supports these sorts of things, please also talk to me. Um, let's do this together. Uh, I think this could be transformative. So we'll leave it there. Thank you, Eric. 30 seconds. <laughs> Mayor Hasler, your, your remarks on, on action. Thank you very much. I think a call to action is urgent at several levels, but number one, when talking about climate migration, as Eric was saying, we need to reduce emissions. We need to confront climate crisis, and this means international, national, and local challenges. In our city, we are trying to bring to that challenge with a new um, waste management that's important for us. And we are also working in public parks, which are green lungs for our cities and our countries. And they are also at risk. And second is promoting decent employment. Here we are talking about creating resilient communities. We need also to work on the employment and the capabilities and capacities of people, putting decent employment at the center. Thank you very much. And let's keep working together. That's the key. Thank you, Mayor Hasler. Both Natifu. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Excellency. My call to action will be three points. The first one is um, we've had lots of momentum and lots of energy that's going around uh, within the different spaces. For example, the, the ex expanded Kampala Ministerial Declaration and all the actions like you've heard from all the IOM country representatives in the room and, show and showcasing uh, exemplary leadership in the spaces of um, advancing climate change and human mobility. Uh, that clearly points to the fact that we have an opportunity to advance all those actions that are being taken everywhere, collectively, to a global stage. The COP28 uh, 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 president-elect has actually pronounced himself on four priorities for the COP in Dubai. The first one is talking about uh, accelerate the clean energy transition and by extension emission reductions and keeping temperature rise below two degrees centigrade. The second one is reform land, land use and transform food systems. And the third one is speaking about increasing and reforming climate finance. And the fourth is bound around putting nature, people, lives and livelihoods. So there, therein lies a very great opportunity to advance within those four priorities that Dubai has advanced as uh, the framing of COP28 to take this discussion forward. And there's a precedent set already. Uh, as most of the people in the room might know, the discussion on human mobility displacement, displacement has been in, in the COP processes for quite a while, since 210 when we had the Cancun adaptation frameworks, and later, uh, eight years later, in Katowice and Poland, where we had recommendations about migration as part of the uh, COP decisions. And then somehow it went a bit silent. So I think with all this momentum building up and where we've reached that, there's a very uh, great opportunity. The second point is the timing. Again, based on what is happening within here, um, there's nothing as good as timing and taking advantage of the actions across the different continents and combine this with whatever is going to happen at COP and then maybe try to find out how we can how we can have a cover decision to those that are private to the negotiations. We know what cover decision is about. The political decisions that leaders pronounce themselves about in terms of the issues that are affecting the different sectors across the globe. And I think from the demonstrations in the room, the nexus between migration, environment, and climate change, and by extension, human mobility, is one of those that we can take advantage of at this COP28. Finally, uh, to talk about, um, in the climate space, we talk about taking climate action forward to save tomorrow's climate today. But I'll also add, 
in order to save tomorrow's climate today, we also have to include thinking about tomorrow and act today for human mobility and migration. But we can't do that without finance. So three things, finance, finance, and finance, and I think that will be a very good call to action to uh, wind up this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. I'm on the same page with you, finance, finance, and finance. Just to, to share thoughts on this regard, what we see in the, in the Global Center uh, for Climate Mobility, we need to accelerate the diplomacy. Climate mobility is not going to decrease. It's only going to increase, and we need to plan for it globally. So that's one key point. We need also to invest in the people and with the people and plan with the people, increase their agency to determine their own adaptation journeys, because we need to start to discuss adaptation or the other way around. We need to discuss mobility as part of adaptation. And that's a shift in the part, traditional paradigm of adaptation in climate change. Mobility, it's part of adaptation because there are going to be places we won't be able to adapt. Think about sea lies rebel, think about places where extreme drought or extreme heat won't make life possible. So please give a hand to all our panelists and back to you, moderator. Thank you, Board President Alvarado. I appreciate you. Let me just say, okay, I do this for a living. It's how I earn money, getting on the stages, talking in front of important people like you. Uh, moderator, you did a phenomenal job with the challenges that you were faced. So I'd like to have a round of applause for our moderator as well. I'll pass you my CV. <laughs> Good, we'll see what we can do. At this juncture, I would like to keep everyone on the stage because your expertise are no less needed for this next segment. So please, I encourage you to stay where you are and we may come to you. We are now turning to uh, the members here uh, for any intervention that they might have. So just a couple of housekeeping rules again. If you are to speak, if I call your name on this very important pre-approved list, please hold up your little tags, signs, and wave so that uh, one of my um, many uh, assistants can run over um, uh, either with a mic if yours isn't working or just uh, we acknowledge who you are. So within, with that, uh, I will say this. You can either make a comment or ask a question. If you ask a question, you have this brain trust in front of me to, to be able to call upon. Does that sound good? Not if you're awake. Nodding, there's three, four or five people are awake. So first off, uh, I'd like to go to two minutes each. First off, I'd like to go to Putman Kramer, who's the head of Libya delegation at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean. Uh, you should be here somewhere, where are you? Pam, where are you? There they are, please, draw your attentions over there. Two minutes. Excellencies, <clears throat> dear colleagues, thank you. Uh, to all the panel for their um, very thoughtful and thought-provoking remarks. Due to the global climate crisis and the instability resulting from war and conflicts, including the Russian aggression against Ukraine, millions of people are already forced to leave their homeland, moving within and across borders to find safety and dignity. The Euro-Mediterranean region is home to more than 500 million people. It is our home, and as a result of global warming, it is burning and drowning before our eyes. The climate crisis severely impacts the Euro-Mediterranean region with rising temperatures. It is warming 20% faster than the global average. Increasing desertification, rising sea levels, and hampering the sustainability of water supplies. The whole of the MENA region is affected, and floods contribute to making displacement chronic and protracted. The past dramatic summer has only further highlighted the severity of the climate crisis as extreme heat waves, droughts, wildfires, storms and floods have become the new norm. A few weeks ago, Storm Daniel has called, caused terrible loss in parliamentary assembly of the Mediterranean countries such as Greece, Turkey and Libya. Parliamentary assembly of the Mediterranean countries are countries both of transit and destination with their particular sets of issues to manage. Since the beginning of the year, over 2,700 lives have been lost in the Mediterranean as individuals sought a better future in Europe. 
each loss of life is a tragedy. Dear colleagues, looking ahead, North Africa is projected to have the largest proportion of climate migrants relative to its total population, up to 19 million people by 2050. Surviving climate breakdown will require a huge human response. Yes. The world needs a planned and deliberate approach to address migration. We, as Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean, fully support the implementation of the 23 objectives outlined in the Global Compact, especially objective number eight, saving lives. We have been advocating for the recognition of environmental refugee as a legal concept in international law, and we will continue our efforts to make progress on this front. Furthermore, urgent, urgent climate and development action is needed, focusing on concrete prevention, adaptation, and mitigation measures. Mm. Our efforts must center around restoring degraded natural assets and promoting alternatives to displacement. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Mediterranean will be present at COP28, as it has been in the past COPs, to step up international efforts and hold our governments accountable. I thank you for your attention. Putman Kramer, thank you so much. I'd like to move on now just to try and get as many of you uh, to speak as possible. Before I go to uh, the People's Republic of China, I'd like to first go, where's Ecuador? Ecuador is there. Yes, Ecuador. Uh, Alejandro Davalos, please make your 1 minute 30 comment. <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> My best. Thank you to the OIM for this dialogue, and I agree with the panelists that migration patterns are influenced directly or indirectly by natural disasters, natural degradation, and climate change. It's important that states strengthen cooperation, coordinated with international organizations, with development institu financial institutions, local governments, civil society, and private sector. In order to prevent and to prepare to the impact of climate change and natural disasters with the consequences in displacement, displacement and mobility. In Ecuador, we have a law that contemplates the possibility for those people in vulnerability that, with, that need the existence of exceptional reasons at humanitarian level, they are natural disaster victim, and they can have a, a national visa for the country. We are also working via the inclusion of a chapter called Human Mobility and Climate Change in the National Plan of Adaptation to Climate Change. And we also have a national agenda for equality in human mobility about the consequences of climate change in several sections and also the ecology transition. We invite you all to work to cope these challenges with the implementation of the Global Compact for, uh, for, immig for Migration, also the SDGs and Sendai Framework. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. That's the representative from Ecuador. Thank you so much. Moving on now, I think it's Jionan Lin, the director for the International Cooperation Department the National Immigration Administration, the People's Republic of China. Please make your two-minute comments. Okay. Thank you, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the first time that the uh, Chinese um, delegation attend uh, this meeting in person in Geneva. And um, here I want to share with you the following perspectives from the uh, Chinese side. First, to strengthen international cooperation on migration to address climate change. China appreciates the IOM's institutional strategy on migration, environment, and climate change 2021 to 2030. We are actively participating in global climate governance, promoting the building of a fair and equitable global climate governance system, featuring win-win cooperation, and are taking concrete actions to meet corresponding international obligations by accelerating low carbon development and the green transition pushing for carbon peak and carbon neutrality objectives. We would like to share development experiences and best practice with all parties present here. Second, to reduce the negative impact of the climate change on migration through development, the Chinese government advocates a new vision of innovative, 
coordinated, green, open, and shared development. We believe that immigration authorities in all countries should play an active role in promoting an orderly and efficient global flow of talents, technologies, and resources needed for green development. Recently, the National Immigration Administration of China have launched an online appointment inquiry function for visa and issued a new version of foreign permanent residence, resident card aiming to improve the convenience of foreigners working and living in China. And we are committed to give full play to the important role of migration in sustainable development. And final but not the least, to increase support for developing countries on climate adaptation. China firmly upholds the goals, principles, and the framework of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement adheres to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. The international community should, play, should pay greater attention to the climate change challenges faced by developing countries and help them to enhance adaptive capacity. Mm -hmm. China urges developed countries to face up to their own capacities, responsibilities, and obligations in dealing with climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm trying to squeeze every single minute out of the next three I have. Uh, but then I will be coming to, 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 to you, moderator, to see if there's anything you can give us in summation to wrap up this part of this, because I know we've got a very hungry audience. So next up, Maria Caradin. Karadin Isley, uh, if I could ask you to wait, there you are. Please, you have a minute and a half. Thank you very much. I hope uh, you can hear me. I'm Maria Karadin Isley from UN Women. Um, so, uh, Mr. President uh, and Excellencies, as climate crisis intensifies around the world, more people are migrating in search of safety, livelihoods, and employment opportunities. And yet, Access to safe and regular migration channels remains largely out of reach, further, furthering the risk of human rights violations. Mm. Increases in gender-based violence against women and girls in the aftermath of disasters and climate-induced emergencies are well documented, especially among those who are uh, population groups that are displaced across and within borders. Without access to climate-responsive, safe and regular migration uh, pathway, uh, the risk of exploitation and abuse grows enormously. Against this background, we would like to suggest two concrete actions for ensuring a gender-responsive approach to tackling the compounding issues of climate change and migration. Number one, invest in the collection, analysis and dissemination of sex-disaggregated data and gender statistics on climate change and migration to support evidence-based policies and programs. Data can help governments and international actors design new or strengthen existing mig migration pathways that increase options for gender-responsive, safe, and regular migration. Number two, climate action must provide dedicated financial resources to ensure the full meaningful and equal participation of women migrating and of course other population groups uh, that mi are migrating because of climate change. With few words, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, thank Madam so Moderator. Much. I appreciate you, the policy specialist for the UN Women. Uh, I want to go now to St. Kitts and Nevis, to the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Sustainable Develop Development, uh, there you are. Please have your say, uh, 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 Sher Sherilita Dora Tyson. Sorry, the, the names not ma don't match the thing on my chart, so I'm not saying them correctly. Please, Sherilita, have your say. Your Excellencies, I am pleased to have the opportunity to participate in the session of the International Dialogue on Migration. This session's theme is both topical and timely as it highlights the need for decisive and all-inclusive policies, plans, and programs that will address the looming humanitarian crisis that climate change could bring to our doorsteps. Undoubtedly, 
we are very aware of the mass migration of people from Africa to Europe and from South and Central America to the United States, fleeing conflict, terror, and persecution. However, climate change has caused and will continue to cause if we also do not address definitively the most, this, this root cause, significant environmental issues that lead to severe economic hardship and an impetus for people to seek a better life elsewhere. St. Kitts and Nevis is considered as the smallest nation in the Western Hemisphere and one of many small island developing states in the Caribbean region. We live in a region in which the threat of natural disasters such as hurricanes, floods, and droughts is existential. And some of these threats have become more frequent and intense and their destruction more severe on the impact of climate change, which could lead to migration issues. Climate change is real. The impact of climate change in our region is evident. Some of our small island economies in the region are potentially one disaster away from devastating disruption, severe economic hardship, and a serious humanitarian crisis. Tropical storm Felipe has just passed through the region, and I am sitting here wondering about my home, my family, my country, and my region because of the extremely heavy flooding that we experienced yesterday. Building human and infrastructural capacity and building resilience into the development plans are critical to the sustainable growth and development of our country and our region. In St. Nevis, we are now transforming our economy into a small island developing state. Considering this, we have thought about the future by taking action today. Mm -hmm. Yet in fact, it is incumbent on all of us to think about averting, and if not alleviating tomorrow's catastrophe by purposeful and positive actions today. Through these discussions, I hope therefore, we can develop a sense of collectivism and consensus that could drive the implementation and, initi and initiatives for the good of all. My presence here today, therefore, is to participate in this international discussion with the objective of contributing to the dialogue on migration with special consideration of the peculiarities and vulnerabilities mm -hmm. of small island developing states, promoting migration policy changes that are equitable and fair, and considering standards and best practices in dealing with these migration issues. May it please you. Indeed, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your contribution. I am going to go uh, to one more uh, uh, person. I fear, because you had so much time taking away from you, uh, former President Carlos, that it is only fair that we give some of that time back. So I'm just going to keep you on stage for a little while longer. I hope you don't mind at all. Perfect. So we've just got one more before I, before I hand over back to you. Um, the permanent representative of Ukraine in Geneva. Where are you? There you are. Please, two minutes. Thank you very much. I would like to first thank the distinguished panelists uh, for their uh, insightful contribution to the discussion, which, di uh, which highlighted various factors linking uh, climate change and human mobility. What I propose to look at uh, things from a bit different perspective, connecting the dots between climate change, human mobility, and wars. Unfortunately, this inter interconnectivity has been often uh, overlooked and omitted in various uh, deliberations and fora. Thus, we see a need to fill this gap and deepen our understanding of the adverse effects of war on climate, environment, and movement of population. Quite illustrative of this pattern is Russia's armed aggression against my country, the impact of which has been felt well beyond Ukraine's borders. Not only has the war triggered one of the largest displacement crises in modern history, it has also been disastrous in terms of its environmental and climate uh, damage. I will share with you some figures. Almost a third of Ukrainian forests have been damaged. Ukraine lost about 90% of its wind and more than 40% of its solar electricity generation. 
About one-third of Ukraine territories remain dangerous because of Russian mines and explosive remnants of war. Russia's detonation of Kakhovka hydroelectric power plants led to the biggest uh, ecological disaster in Europe, forcing tens of thousands of people to move. Emissions attributable to the war has triggered uh, an increase of 120 million tons of greenhouse gases. This includes emissions from forest fires, military activity, displacement-related emissions, damage to infrastructure. The figure is more than half size uh, of Ukraine's entire emissions in pre-war 2021. Thus, the armed aggression is deepening the climate crisis at a time when global greenhouse gas emissions are already running a record high. Given the profound effects of the war on environment, climate change, and human mobility, we believe that this issue deserves consideration at the upcoming COP28, and we also think that thought should be given to including the war emission uh, in UN emission accounting. I will stop here to give other speakers. Uh, You're very generous. Speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just before we break uh, for, for lunch, I just wanted to give you an opportunity, moderator, to, to perhaps sum up what you've learned or perhaps draw on what your panel has said uh, to break us for lunch. Thank you. And I want to thank the panelists and thank you all for your attention. If I may share just uh, that opinion of what I've learned. Two things. One is that there is not such a thing as a small action. And we can see it in the panel. It's all across multi-level, multi-region. From the multilateral forums, from business, in governments, to working on making livelihoods possible with a well in one community, either in Africa or in Southeast Asia, to making better the livelihoods of people in cities. Every aspect of it matters. There is no one that is more important than the other. And my second thought is that then there should be something that holds us together. I do believe that perhaps the worst boundary that it exists, it exists in our minds when we create a boundary between us and them. When we create that boundary between us and them, our behavior is different than if we have an approach of togetherness, of working together. And if there's one thing with climate change, is that it affects us all as a, as a global community. If we breach that divide in our minds first of that us and them, and we consider ourselves as one, diverse, beautiful in that condition, but as one, as we act, might change. And, and I think that concept of origin influences all of our action from there. And with those final remarks, it is at this point that I would like to call for a break so that you can rest, reconnect uh, with colleagues and friends and have maybe a cheeky bite to eat if there's something out there. Uh, our proceedings will start again at three. Now, if you find yourself wanting more, you haven't had enough, there's, there's plenty more for you to do, you could stay in this room. And uh, although it is a lunch break, you will get some food for thought as well as some sandwiches, <laughs> which will be nice for everybody. We have got, uh, for those of you participating in the side event on informing the future, understanding human mobility in the context of disaster, climate change, and environmental degradation, uh, organized by the platform on disaster displacement. Please make sure that you stay in the room. There's going to be some, some nourishment given to you. Aside from that, I shall see you again at three o'clock sharp. Thank, Thank you. you.